not now. So, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to the first global supply chain in e-commerce Nordic edition. My name is Carlos Monteiro. I'm the founder of Evolve. So I'm, I'm really stoked about what we're going to discuss here today. Uh, yeah, put a lot of effort to make this happen. Um, Evolve exists because I believe that it's all about alliances, it's all about community, uh, it's all about education, it's all about conversation. Um, I've been in the world of commerce now for, for about eight years, and I see that the future of commerce, uh, B2B commerce, it's, uh, you know, it's about conversations, it's about education, it's about thought leadership. And what you're going to experience here with me today is some great speakers, people who are doers, people who are experts in their field. Um, I won't extend uh, myself too much here. I actually want you to, to, to experience this, this with me. Uh, we have amazing companies that I actually I need to thank all of them for because without these companies uh, believing in Evolve and believing, uh, believing in what we stand for, this wouldn't be happening today. So uh, I want to, to say thank you very much to DSP, Divante, Implementing Consult Implement Consulting Group, Spectrum, Fulfillment Group, Post North Sweden. Arrogant and oxygen. You guys are amazing. Your marketing teams are incredible. So I, I, I also want to extend my, uh, you know, uh, uh, I want to say thank you to, to, to your marketing team. And we're about to get started. So the first speaker today uh, is Henrik Wilson. He's with DSP. He's going to be talking about uh, how you can keep your supply chain flowing in a world of change. I think the world has seen massive changes and Henrik there will be talking about how DSV, one of the, the, the probably the most important players in global logistics uh, in the world, uh, has managed to help their companies, the, the, their customers in the Nordics. So um, um, yeah, I'll be introducing Henrik very soon. Mr. Nielsen, welcome. Good morning, good morning, Carlos. I was good morning. everybody must be awake now. I think everyone is awake and fresh, and I'm about to have my coffee here as well. Where are you speaking from? I'm actually right now placed at our headquarter in Copenhagen, and I can tell you the sun is shining and everything is nice in Copenhagen. The reason for me mentioned that everybody should be awake, it is because <laughs> it was so nice, very loud, music you played for us so um, i'll say good morning and maybe good afternoon to somebody as well hopefully yeah there's nothing like starting an event with danish humor danish humor so i love it and <laughs> henrik what are you going to be just uh, maybe some highlights with, uh, of what you're going to be sharing today and then we get started yeah i, I would say the, the the highlight for today is actually uh, what we saw uh, in the end of 2019 when the pandemic uh, started and, and we were used to there was a lot of space on all vessels around the world and it was very very cheap to get things moved then it was like the the whole world uh, stopped doing 20 and 21 and uh, then we saw a lot of uh, issues we solved it together with our customer and also found some new solution for uh, for the global market henrik the stage is yours thank you very much and let's do it Thank you very much uh, to all of you. And uh, yes, it is correct. Uh, I'm placed in uh, in Copenhagen. I'm working for for DSV ANC, and we have the headquarter in uh, in Copenhagen. I have just uh, on the next slide uh, made a small agenda for you. So if we go to this one, it said just few few slides about uh, DSV, the DSV group. Then about how could we actually uh, help you keeping supply chains flowing. And, and when we say that, it is actually in a world of change because nothing is like it was back in 2019. Then I would just like to uh, share some thoughts about the sustainability because it's very important for us as a company. And I also do believe that it's very important for you uh, yeah, as part of the whole world. So uh, it was actually my agenda for 
for today. And then uh, if we go to the next slide, I have got only three slides about, uh, at, about DSV. And it is just to tell you that we actually started uh, back in 1976 and uh, then we are continue. That means we are only 46 years old company, uh, but we have grown our company uh, with uh, organic growth, but also with merger and acquisition. And I've just shown you how, how uh, we have been making uh, merger and acquisition since 1997. And then up to, yeah, I can tell you, we will continue. We have only one goal, and this is to be the biggest freight forwarder in the world. Right now we are number three, but uh, this one is our, our journey. If you go to the next slide, then I've just tried to illustrate what are we actually doing. I can tell you that we have got more than 75,000 people working for DSV all over the world, 24 seven, seven days a week, 365 days for you and for the entire DSV organization. And if we don't have a DSV office in the world, then we have a partnership with agents and so on. For us, it is very important to say that we cover the whole world. We are not only Nordic, but we are worldwide. We also see that we are actually focused on ANC, we are focused on road, and then we are focused on solu solution and what we call 4PL. So we go out and help our customer to make agreement with subcontractors like we do for the ANC, for the road and for the solution. And, and what you can see is actually via air and sea. And this is actually what it means. Air and sea, we are dealing with air freight and we are dealing with sea freight. It is important for me to tell you that we don't own any ships or any aeroplanes. Um, we have a lot of uh, dialogue and contracts and cooperation with subcontractors. Actually, the same go for, for road. Uh, mainly all the trailers you see on the road is, is, uh, is subcontracted out to, uh, to other truckers and, uh, and uh, the trailers is what we have for, for lease. We said 90% of all the trailers and equipment is, is actually not ours. Then we have our 10% our, is our own. If you go to solution, we have a lot of square meters around the world where we make all this fulfillment and, and we have auto store and we can offer service in South America or South Africa, or we can do it in South Europe. We can do that all over the, the world. It is very important for us to offer a good service to, uh, to our customer, make sure that we follow the development when we talk about e-commerce it is important that we have the space and that we can offer you value, meaning that, that you should concentrate about selling or buying uh, your product. Then we will take care about all this with the solution. The other one is actually just about our market position on the next slide. And, and uh, I would say, if you look at this one, we just said we are number three in the world. If we look at the air freight, sea freight and uh, road freight, and we said we are number 10 in the world for log logistic solution. Logistic solutions means actually warehouses around the world. Road is actually the tonnage we move mainly in, in Europe and in uh, America. Then we are number three in the world. Sea freight, we count how many containers do we actually move. And in the air freight, it's actually how much cargo or how much tonnage do we, do we move. So it's more to give you a picture about uh, our company. If you go to the next one, and this is actually just, we're back to the agenda, as you can see, and then we go to the next one again. And for us on the next page, it's something about keeping supply chains flowing in a world of changes. And what we mean is actually, we never said no. We always said yes, and then we give alternatives. And we have actually learned that uh, during 2020 and 21, and of course here in 2022, what we saw, what's happened in the, mainly with the, the, with the corona back in the end of 2019 from China, then we went to Denmark in, in 2020 and, uh, and so on. 
but but it is very important for us to tell you that we have never said no and all cargo is moved around the world we would like very much to help you to grow your business and keeping your supply chain flowing together with us or together with some of our colleagues and then again our mission is actually we want to make sure that we act local but we actually are a global company and then i said size matters as i showed you on the other page that was actually number three in the world you know, when we look at the tonnage and the number of tu we are moving that means that then we get the space on the shipping line or the airlines we also have a lot of cooperation with a lot of different airlines and a lot of different shipping lines and the same go for the trucker and and so on so we have a lot of possibility not only one airline or not only one shipping line and the most important thing is actually that we have got people behind and of course an it system on the next place on the next slide sorry i will just show you what are we actually doing so what we are doing as a freight forwarding service is everything from you either you as the seller or you as a buyer we will make sure that we get in touch with your supplier in china or we get in touch with your customer in us or in australia or in sweden whatever so we we make all this we take the booking and then we deliver to your customer or we pick it up at your supplier and we deliver it to your place so this is actually what we do then we have a big cooperation with the subcontractors and mentioned before the subcontractors could be airlines or shipping lines or express career companies or we make insurance or it could be custom clearance and so on so we do that together with the with subcontractors so we don't have any uh, rails or trains we don't have any ships we don't have any uh, aeroplanes but we actually have uh, a charter network for for the air freight meaning that we have actually a, a route going out of europe into uh, for example to uh, Huntsville in alabama or to rockford uh, close to chicago we also have it from shanghai into europe and we have a huge charter network where approximately 12 to 15 percent of all our air freight is moved in our own network then we have logistic and uh, distribution meaning that we have the warehouses we take it into the warehouse we we pick and pack it and we send it up to out to uh, our customers customer and we do that together with the uh, dsv road together with dsv solution again our key resources as mentioned it is the people behind we need people and we have the best people in the world we have our it system we can't do all these things without the it we have all the industry know-how we we have a workflow so we know what should we actually do and so on on the next one it's a little bit about uh, what's actually happened uh, in 2000 and uh, and uh, 19 20 21 22 i can tell you in the end of 2019 we we actually in december 2019 we uh, we got an email from our colleague in in uh, in china saying there's something happened in wuhan and uh, there's corona we will probably close down and so on and all of us in europe and uh, here at the headquarters said ah, okay we are feeling sorry for you but but it will probably stay in uh, china but it didn't so in march 2020 we actually uh, closed down uh, or not closed down but we moved uh, a lot of our staff starting working home in march 2020 then in march 2021 they ever given i don't know if you can remember that but there was a huge vessel was actually sitting down in the suez channel for for seven days stopping all the in and out of the suez channel it was in in uh, in march 2021 and i can tell you this vessel was uh, called ever given and ever given was a vessel if you can remember that it was actually 
400 meters long and it was 60 meters wide. And a waist like this one is actually carrying more than 22,020 feet container. So it is amazing, a vessel. There was actually some customer told us, couldn't you just pick up this container from the vessel? And we said, no, we're sorry, we can't do that. We have to wait. Again, we are giving alternative. We have to wait until we, we catch a port somewhere. The vessel is out sailing again. Then in, uh, in uh, not in March 2022, but here in February 2022, we saw the, the Russian going into Ukraine and ever since there have been uh, big issues in, in, uh, in Ukraine and also in, in Russia. Uh, for me, it is more to say this was happened in 2020. Denmark, we closed down a little bit. 2021, Suez closed down. 2022, there was a war or there's still a war in, in uh, Ukraine. And then my next question is what's happened actually in 2023 in February or in March? We don't know. But we know that there's a high demand of freight coming from Asia into Europe, into Denmark, into the Nordic countries. We also know that 90% of all cargo in global, in the world, all cargo, 90% of all cargo is actually moving via a vessel. So it's so important that we still have the possibility to, uh, to have vessels sailing around in the, in the world. Before the 2019 and 20 and 21, there was a lot of space on the vessels and the rate was actually okay. Then there was a lot of the, the, the COVID in, in, uh, in 2020 and 2021 and in the beginning of 2022, we see actually uh, ports uh, closed in China. We see that there was uh, a big uh, bottlenecks around uh, all the ports we see. Uh, all the, the airports was closing down, or not all, but a lot of the, the airports was closing down due to the COVID. We, we did, did see that the captain, the, the, the crew on the airlines and uh, on the vessels uh, also getting COVID and, and, and so on. None of us was actually flying, so all the flights were standing down at, uh, at, uh, at the runways and so on. So we actually looked into what can we do before we were using vessels. Then we were starting thinking, okay, then we could use rail. We started actually trucks going from, uh, from China into, uh, into the Nordic countries. We actually also made the possibility to, uh, to make a sea air solution, meaning that we, we did sail from, uh, from, for example, Shanghai into Dubai, and then we fly from Dubai into, uh, into Europe. Then we saw the, the Russian sanctions. Then we couldn't use or we have decided that all the sanctions for the for the Russian was actually we don't want to use uh, the railway of the Russians because then Mr. Putin and, and uh, the government in Russia is actually getting money because we are using the railways. We didn't want to go transit with our trucks into uh, Russia higher. So there was actually a, a, a lot of things uh, happen. And then we start thinking, what can we actually do? We did continue with the sea air solution. We did continue with the, with the, with the air freight and, and the sea freight. But we also started a, a kind of a, we call it Al Jazeera Express, meaning we take your cargo from China into Al Jazeera in the southern part of, uh, of uh, Spain. We can do that in two weeks' time. Then we have a DSV uh, terminal down in uh, in Al Jazeera, we have a DSV truck, so we unload the container in Al Jazeera, put it on to, on a DSV truck, and then we actually move it on a truck from uh, Al Jazeera up to our customer in the Nordic or in in Europe, and we could cut the transit time down to as it was with uh, with uh, the rail. So this one was actually the alternative we found due to the uh, COVID and due to the sanction against uh, the Russian. But for us, it is still very important that we have staff behind and uh, everything is, uh, what I would say, depend on, uh, on people. If we go to, uh, to the next one, it, it's, uh, I just want to say, it's just quick again said, good customer service, high data quality and growth for your company is what we want. 
We want to, to make an excellent customer service to you. We want you that you should feel that we actually roll out the red carpet every time when we speak to you. If you go to the next page and then click again to, uh, to the next one, I just want to, to tell all of you that we are committed to whatever we do. We are actually responsible for the way we are working. And, and we have said that the green, we are very much on top of the green agenda and, and we can offer green solutions. We can offer green air freight. We can offer green sea freight. We can offer green road freight. Of course, there's, there's some limitation right now, but it, it is actually a journey. We started a long time ago and on the next page, you can actually see that our scope two and three, we said by the end of 2030, we'll reduce that with 30 and 40%. And the scope three is actually this one where we said 30% together with our subcontractors and together with you, we will reduce that with 30% again by the end of 2030. I couldn't follow the, the time, but uh, I believe that the next one is actually my last slide. So if there's any question or anything you didn't understand uh, due to my language or I'm speaking too fast or whatever, uh, just let me know. I, I need to answer. Hello. Hey, guys. Hi, uh, Carlos. Just, just some technicalities. So um, first off, Henrik, very interesting. Uh, I think like from, from my perspective here, I've been in working in commerce and we always speak about all the fancy and beautiful things about commerce, but we all know that things they need to get from A to Y, A to Z, right? And without logistics, it's, it's ridiculous to talk about uh, an e-commerce platform, in my opinion. So I think what you shared here is very interesting. So the first question we have here comes from JJ and he's asking, in a post-COVID world, what are, the what are the biggest supply change challenge that uh, I believe your customers faced and DSV as well? Uh, I, I, I would say uh, what we saw was actually that they were queuing up with kilometers and kilometers of containers that we need to deliver to the port, for example, in, in, in uh, Shanghai, in China. And, and uh, there was not space enough uh, because the vessel was not sailing as scheduled due to the COVID that then the port was closed or it was closed down maybe for 24 hours or 48 hours. And there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of delays, uh, uh, some area we couldn't drive into and, and, and so on. But again, we, we managed, but, but it was not like uh, before uh, COVID where we said, yeah, okay, it will take 46 days, for example. Then it took 66 days or maybe 96 days to get something moved from China into Europe, into our uh, warehouse and then make the distribution. There was an enormous need. Uh, probably all of you who's participating in, in, uh, in this webinar is, is saying, yes, that there was a, a lot of need. We could see all the shops, uh, all the e-commerce was very, very busy. So um, the biggest issue was actually to get the, the space on the vessels. I can tell you now, that it's it's a, it's a good message I have to you that uh, we saw that the rate was going up and the service was going down. Now we actually see the service is going up and the rate is going down. So it's a total other situation now. When we are talking about, for example, import sea freight from China into uh, into Europe, now we can get it on uh, a lot of different uh, shipping lines. We can get it quite fast uh, into Europe and we can actually uh, see a huge reduction in the freight rate as well as from last month in, in August. We saw all this was actually happened. We saw that the rate was going fast up back in, in 2021. Now we see the rate is going fast down. But luckily, the service is going up again. Great. Thank you, Henrik. Another question that came in, uh, what strategy did you use to overcome the Russian-Ukraine challenge for your Nordic customers? Because that's probably 
that was that, that was probably some kind of impact there, right? And I think overcoming that, I don't know, maybe with some kind of intelligence to your customers, can you perhaps share? Yeah, uh, I, yeah. I, I, I would say the, before uh, before the invasion in in uh, in February uh, this year, uh, we have a very strong uh, cooperation with our Russian college colleague. We have uh, both in in Kaliningrad in Russia, but also in Belarus and of course in in Ukraine. Um, we decided actually to to quite uh, quick to say that uh, we want to get out of Kaliningrad, we want to get out of Russia, we want to uh, get out of uh, Belarus. We have uh, managed so, and and uh, we also said that uh, if it's not on the sanction list, then we can move cargo to and from Russia, to and from Kaliningrad, and to and from Belarus. But, but in general, we have made a, a lot of changes, so we don't uh, go via Russia or Kaliningrad or Belarus for that sake. Uh, so we find the alternatives. For example, with the Al Casillas Express, where we take it out of uh, straight to uh, to Spain, and then we we don't need to go via Russia. Fantastic, fantastic, Henrik. Thank you very much. I think uh, it was great what you just shared here today. Some amazing insights. So I hope if you don't have much to do today, I know I'm, I'm sure you have some time to, to spare. <laughs> I would like so. to <laughs> uh, I would like to invite you uh, maybe to 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 watch the other speakers. But of course, this is going to be recorded. Uh, we're gonna make it you know nice and 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 share it afterwards with everyone. So thank you for sharing this. I I, I learned a lot today, and I just want to thank you and thank uh, the DSVs, Jane in special as well. Big hand to Jane that helped us uh, also to make this happen. So thanks. You're correct. Have a nice, uh, have a nice day, all of you. Have a good one, Henrik. Bye. Bye. All right. So coming next uh, at 9:35, we will have Rene, uh, and he is with Oxygen, a, a software company from Odense. So we'll be back very soon.
right, all right, all right. So coming up next, Rene Tristan Lidixen. He's a PhD in strategy and entrepreneurship. He is also a member of the board of directors at Danish Web Sales. He's also a partner at Oxygen, which is a software company uh, based in Olense. And Rene has uh, been the director at Legal Education and been responsible for over 400 people uh, with a, a massive UNL uh, across 15 countries. And he's also led some uh, very interesting and uh, very interesting and complex projects in, in, the, in, in the world of business to business. So I'd like to invite Rene to speak with us today. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Hope hey, Rene. Nice hey. to have you here. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. We're in sunny Olense, so all is good. All right. Uh, so you're in Olense. Can you please just give us uh, uh, some highlights of what you're going to be sharing with us today? Really excited about your talk and what you shared with me. So, Sure. Um, could I share my screen or are you going to do that for me? Yeah. Uh, you are. Perfect. Thank you. Lovely. Uh, do I have control over this narrative or do you have control over my uh, PowerPoint? Do you have control over <laughs> So, okay. Thanks, but I am going to talk a little bit about uh, exploiting B2B digital commerce opportunities in competitive markets. And my focus here is five leadership principles. Now, this data is based on a combination of experience, I would guess pretty vast, more than 20 years, but also based a bit on research because researchers tend to allow academics and leaders like myself to understand more in depth of what's going on for instance, in a market based on uh, based on data, and you know that thing sometimes moves things a lot. So next slide, please. I believe that we all have a pretty clear picture of what leadership really is, and we also understand the concept of a principle. But what we may not always understand and share equally is what really is digital commerce. So here goes one offering. Digital commerce enables customers to purchase goods and services through an interactive and self uh, service experience. This is what I've tried to illustrate on the model on the left. But what it also does, and I think this particular area of interest is important in this session because this is about supply chain, it includes the people, processes, and technologies throughout the customer buying journey. And <clears throat> coordinates all the touch points uh, that each customer uh, must experience across every single touch point wherever you are in the world. And according to the latest research, what we may think was the most important thing for C-level leaders is all about sales and self-service. This turns out not to be true. C-level people are really talking about the importance of simplifying an administration and streamlining sales processes. That comes out as the strongest driving force for B2B companies currently. That also accounts just for companies that already sell digitally and those who haven't even started yet. And that may point towards the fact that C-level people are often talking to the fact that what they can control, they can also minimize, they can do more effect, effect, effective or efficient, sorry, without the influence of, for instance, competitors. So this is an offering of what digital commerce could look like in 2022. Next slide, please. So the real question here is why is this important? Uh, Carlos and the rest of the team and I talked this morning about what are the real challenges for C-level people in B2B companies? And many of us tend to think, well, the reason why they have to invest in B2B e-commerce is really that the competition are doing really well, or we need to do this because we're gonna get back in the game, or we wanna stay ahead of our, of our competition and serve our customers really well. That's also true, but there is a huge underlying reason for why you must invest in B2B commerce. And many of us tend to forget that particular reason. Next slide, please. You see, this year, 2022, is the final year at the rest of our lives where we will have an equal balance between digital natives in the workforce and digital immigrants. Digital natives, as you see on the green line, are growing in terms of their, their voicing, their demands, their way of lives in the work markets. And that means you have to, simply on the base of these demographics, you have to look into commerce because digital natives, natives are going to expect 
a very high level of service digitally. They don't want to pick up their phone. They don't want to see orders on the supplier's website. They want things on TikTok. They want to communicate with you guys, suppliers, on FaceTime. They want to talk to you, not through emails, but through voice recognition and stuff like that. They want to understand how their order history, what that looks like on an app. They don't want to go to your website because they don't have to. They haven't learned to do that. So this is one of the real key reasons why C-Level must have a conversation on how they can serve their purchase, for instance. Next slide, please. Because purchases in this, in this combination, sorry about that, perspective, are surprisingly ahead of the adoption curve. If you look at the green line, this is the normal standard adoption curve of technologies in most societies. Now purchases, and then remember that this year is where things change. They are digital natives by the count. They are actually 13% ahead in terms of being innovators. 26% of them are early adapters and 40% of them are early majorities. So purchases are not gonna talk with suppliers on the phone. They're wanting to have their order history displayed on TikTok. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a huge challenge for B2B companies. I sit on a couple of boards, and um, one of the boards, family-owned company, half a billion dollar uh, turnover, very profitable. They're owned by a family. Uh, they're about my age. You know, they're born in the mid-60s. They have no trouble investing 100 million DKK in automation of their warehouse. No worries, because they understand the logic that they must be very efficient in the handling of goods. But they're very challenged in investing 1 million DKK in their e-commerce across 26 countries throughout their distributors. That needs to be even better documented, the ROI, compared to how they document the ROI on the 100 million DKK investment in the warehouse. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is worrying. Next slide, please. So how does this convey into five leadership principles? Let's take the first one. Next slide, please. I think it's fair to say that many B2B companies see sales, product people, customer service as the heroes. That may turn out to be insufficient. One of the agendas in my conversations and also looking at data is that C-Level must make marketing the new heroes in B2B companies. You may recall and resemble what I'm gonna tell you right now. I see companies, millions of dollars of turnover, have a huge sales force. Many people work in sales, sales support, product development, product ownership, and you got two guys sitting in marketing. One of them works with catalogs, paper. The other one owns the website. And they have a very small and very limited budget. They usually have a very little say, and they're also used to do a little bit of HR, they do a little bit of work in the, in the cantina, and then they also greet new guests coming in. And then sometimes they're asked to do some offline propositions or marketing uh, along with their agencies to promote the brand. That's wrong. You need to make marketing the new heroes. And the reason why is because marketing is that muscle that's going to understand how do we talk with our customers on Facebook? Sales does not have a grasp on that. They don't know. Marketing are those that are going to generate new leads across the entire value chain. So B2B companies are now looking to understand on the basis of data on how their end customers are reacting to their products. So not just to cut the line to the distributors, that's fine, because that's I think we're going to talk, have a lot of conversations on the channel conflicts, but they need to understand much more about how is our customers? How are they doing? What are they thinking? Do they like our services? Although that service or product is delivered through a distribution. Marketing discipline, again. Marketing is not just about a website. <clears throat> I think we've heard that a thousand times. Oh no, the website is just a small part of it. It's about integrating and understanding how leadership and management can use data on, a, on an everyday basis as a grounds for making sound decisions. Now, if you read the text, only about 26% of B2B companies interviewed, it's a thousand people, are actually leaving it or entrusting digital commerce to heads of marketing. The rest are sitting with sales or finance. I believe this is one of the first principles that C-Level must have a conversation on. You've got to make marketing the new heroes and invest in marketing. Next slide, please. 
the companies that we work with, I sit again with a lot of C-level people and they're the same generation as I am, a digital immigrant. We love setting targets, but we also love data. And if we have a sufficient amount of data, we're okay to set targets. However, as we're moving into an era of commerce and digitalization, the fourth uh, technical revolution, as some people call it, there's a lot of data we don't have. We don't understand what our end customers are thinking. Many of the B2B companies don't even have a very tight relationship to the distributors. They have no idea what's going on in their heads. And the understanding of competition is also sometimes a bit lackful. So the key here is that we're taking a generation of leaders that have a vast experience in setting data, oh sorry, setting targets on the basis of data. Now we're going to have to set some hard targets in the measures of success at the lack of data. And most C-level people dislike that. And as you see the uh, text below, it says that only 43% of B2B companies measure the return on investment of their digital sales initiatives. That is also a hard challenge for leaders in B2B companies. Next slide, please. There's a culture there's an inherent in it, most leaders in that we need to do our stuff perfect. When you do a product development, just look at all the testing that product development is going through. Look at the sales training of your sales staff. How do you pick up the phone in your, your customer support? How important is it that you're really on time with your deliveries? We're very good at that. It's a lot of perfection. I mean, this world is so connected that you can deliver almost any product at any time, anywhere. And most co companies and customers are happy with that. However, the problem with commerce is that the digital development is so fast that if you are going to wait until you have the perfect plan for launching whatever you want to launch, you're too late. So there's something about being able to say, well, we might want to launch a 40% ready to go commerce solution to serve our distributors and to understand more of what's going on in the mind of the end users. But those 40%, they need to be perfect. We're not gonna to wait to have this last 60% develop off that solution. Because if you do, you're way too late. So what management really does is that they actually struggle a lot to integrate digital commerce into the existing business strategy. What they should be doing is saying, well, the commerce is really is the strategy. It doesn't have to be integrated. You have to make it the strategy. And your challenge for that the established procedures and practices contrast a lot the need for speed to market. Next slide, please. This is one of my favorites. Um, throughout my last 20 years as a C-level leader, because uh, I've also been sitting on the other side of the desk where I've had conversations with consultancies that wanted to sell me something, is that we tend to feel that investing in commerce it's just a lot of money and we're not really sure what's going to be the payback for that. The problem is investing in a commerce platform might cost you two or three or five million DKK, fine. However, there's a lot of investments around that. You should start with investing in developing, redesigning, reorganizing your marketing department. That's a huge investment. And that actually comes with the ability to deliver and gain results from a digital commerce investment. And a lot of leaders forget that. There's a tendency to understand digital commerce as an investment in a commerce platform. Nothing could be more wrong. What you really are investing in is the transformation of your organization. It's not about platforms and integrations, APIs, microservices, and stuff like that. That's actually the easy part. The hard part and the expensive part and the risky part is transforming your organization to act and deliver on the premises of digital commerce. A rule of thumb says, let's say you invest 10 million, uh, 10 million DKK in a project, 20% of those 10 million or 2 million will probably go into the platforms, the API, the microservices, and so on. The next 3 million are probably going into your marketing spend. Now that's a weird one. How, do you, how much money do you really need to spend 3 million on marketing on the next two to three years? Yes, you do, because you have, an, you have a job to communicate your value proposition and you gotta meet your end customers and distributors where they are. Remember, they're digital natives. So you can't just do news forms. It's not gonna work for you. You have to provide a film or a communication area, probably on YouTube, maybe on Facebook, on TikTok. And that's a very new realm for lots of B2B leaders. 
The last part, which is about half, is going into the investment into your organization. You're probably going to have to upgrade people, deliver or hire new competencies or hire as a source. So there's a rule on two, three, and five. That together constitutes a very common and solid digital commerce project. The reason why, or let's say the result of not doing it sufficiently is the fact that these data are from God, God in the last year, that 70% of all digital commerce projects, they do not live to expectation. The platform is there and the IP works well, but you forgot the organization and you didn't invest sufficiently in marketing. Next, please. This is the fifth principle and the last one. I see a tendency, it is developing in a positive way, but there still seems to be a tendency or let's say an arm's length from sea level to commerce. Commerce is something that kind of lives down in the marketing department. And remember, there are just two people, uh, one catalog guy, the other one is con concentrating on the website. There's no time to talk or company to work with commerce as a strategy subject. C-level must own the digital commerce. It's gotta be equally as important as the investment into uh, increasing or developing your warehouse facilities, your robotic, uh, your robotic warehouse or your supply chain or your procurement or whatever it might be. And this probably is one of the greatest hurdles is that C-level, because these people are like me, we're digital immigrants. So I'm gonna to have to learn a new language. Do I really at the board when I report to them try to explain them and get them on board and understanding how digital commerce can move this company forward on a global competitive scale. Yes, you do. Setting all things aside, this is one of the very most important principles uh, in my view, uh, which is supported by research as well, because what we see is that B2B companies that do invest in digital commerce combined with the C-level ownership grow five times more and faster than those who do not. Next slide, please. Um, if we take these five principles, you will see the yellow line is where we'd like to be. And the orange one is where it is today. This is measured across a number of companies. So the gap between trying to work with as a C-level to forget perfection is actually not that big. It is a challenge, but it's doable. It needs a lot of explanations and conversations of what that really means. So what I'm saying here is understanding the importance of speed to market in contrast to having the entire project finished at 100% because then you're going to be too late. The other one at three o'clock setting targets in spite of lack of data is probably the easiest one because there is a sense of entrepreneurship and setting data, although we don't target, sorry, although we don't have all the data seems to be setting relatively comfortable with sea level leaders. The five o'clock one is a hard one. So you got to invest more than you like, for instance, in your organization. In my perspective, that requires a lot of really good business uh, case simulations a lot of scenario thinking, a lot of calculation going into this area. If you get it and you get it right, and I'm happy to share a couple of cases, cases at some other occasion, this can really move the B2B commerce forward because it's all about people, it's about competencies and not about platforms and APIs and GDPR and decomposable architect and all the funky stuff. The difficult one is make marketing the new heroes. This is where we see the, the largest gap because we're coming out of a culture where sales, product people, customer services people are the real heroes. And we're not used at B2B to really work with highly qualified marketing people. It's a difficult one. And especially linked to the invest more than you like, because this is where most of your, maybe 50% of your investment needs to go into. The last one at about 11 o'clock, sea level must own digital commerce has a gap, but it's doable, it's workable. They seem relatively comfortable with having the ownership of the digital commerce, as long as they get some help on their way and that the board of directors or the owners, the shareholders are willing to commit themselves to saying, well, sea level you need to put some time aside and do it really, really well. Next slide, please. That was all for me. I believe I've spent 20 minutes or so. Uh, so if there are any questions, I'm happy to take some. Fantastic. Uh, Rene, thank you very much. Amazing presentation. 
there's there's one question, but I also have a question for you. Go ahead. In, in regards to making Martin the new heroes, I I'm completely in line with you. And and uh, when when we had our mastermind session, I spoke about the role of education and thought yeah, leadership yeah. and 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 really like turning your teams into into uh, a demand generation machine via education, right? How do you yeah. see that in 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 this new era that we are living where people buy from they trust people they don't trust necessarily brands right so how do you see that well the question pertains to what level of education do marketeers need to have do i understand you correctly no uh, or the role of the role of uh, thought leadership and education as well in 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 this era that we're living uh, today right so the role of education is really important. Uh, and education is not just about understanding how do you provide a solid content or how do you work with your backend on your Umbraco CMS. Education is much more about understanding what is the strategic role of digital commerce? How does that impact our daily lives? How do I, as a B2B company, take whatever Salando does really well? Because remember, the purchase is sitting at the end of your company B2B relation. It's the same guy or girl, or woman sitting home in her sofa shopping on Zalando. So how do I translate that customer fantastic, uh, well, that, that journey that Zalando does really well, how do I translate that into my company? And that's a marketing discipline, but it's also an HR discipline. And it also becomes a sales discipline. So how do you support a lead generated from really solid, let's say, thought leadership, if you're clear on what thought you want to lead, how do I translate that into a very, let's say, uh, meaningful customer relationship? So that, yes, indeed, is, is, is indeed pointing towards the, the need for education. Very nice. Uh, thank you for that. We have a question here also from JJ, and he asks, uh, your opinion on overcoming generational gaps to implement a, a successful B2B e-commerce platform? And I believe he's talking about also communication, right? So. Because you, you touched upon those topics as well. So. I, I, I don't know whether you remember the speech from Obama some time ago, um, you know, post his period as a president. But what he said, and I actually think that can be applied in terms of overcoming generations. See leaders, give the key to the young marketeers. They will show you how to do this because they are digital natives. Just give them the key. Trust them. It can be done. That's how you overcome. Maybe not in an afternoon. But you have to put some trust, you have to give them some room to play and then employ people that are much younger than you are and that are born with a smartphone in their hand. They know their way around this and then invest sufficiently in their development. That's how you overcome it. Well, those were uh, amazing insights. So, Rene, I'd like to thank you for your participation here today with us. You're Thanks welcome. very much. I learned a lot and really appreciate it. Thank Thanks you. So much. Have a lovely day. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye. Ciao. All right. So at 10.05, we'll have Hans Elmegord with Fulfillment Group. Uh, so we'll be back very soon. This is a this is a different different conversation. It's pre-recorded because Hans now he is uh, he just moved to moved back, relocated to Canada. So we had like a fireside chat to talk about how the consumer is actually changing the whole logistics industry and how that is affecting also B2B companies. So I'll see you there, 10.05.
All right, everyone. So uh, welcome again. Now we have uh, Hans Elmegard joining. Actually, Hans is in Canada, but I will introduce you, uh, Ben Jones. And Hans is going to be talking about how you know the consumer has changed and is changing the logistics industry. Ben, welcome. Thank you very much for <laughs> for the effort. Please uh, tell us where you're speaking from and uh, what's your role at Fulfillment Group. Of course. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm speaking from uh, not so sunny uh, London on this fine morning. Um, I'm CCO Fulfillment Group. I take care of the new business development and growth of our company from a sales and, and commercial perspective. Fantastic. Ben, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps you could just share some of the challenges that your customers are going through. Then we'll, we'll play the fireside chat I had with, uh, with Hans, and then you come on after for some questions and answers, okay? Sure, sure. So there's a few challenges that our customers uh, typically face. So when they expand internationally and they look to leverage uh, 3PL providers and fulfill, fulfillment providers around the world, they look to build networks of these partners. But when they engage with these partners, well, first of all, it's difficult to find credible, reliable partners in new markets that they're maybe not familiar with. They have to integrate to those partners. So there's quite a cost associated with those integrations, typically. And if you have multiple partners around the world, those costs can escalate quite quickly. And then the third challenge is managing those partners, whether that's managing multiple sets of data and spreadsheets, warehouse management systems, all these fragmented parts of, of a network. So they're the three main challenges that our customers face. Um, and they're the ones, they're the, typically the problems that we, we help them solve through our solution. Brilliant. Thank you for sharing. We'll play Hans now. It's a very interesting conversation, in my opinion. <laughs> and then we'll, uh, we'll be back soon, all right? Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Great. Perfect. All right. So Hans will be on in a minute. Hey everyone, today we have a special presentation. Hans unfortunately could not be with us, but he's with us right here delivering an amazing presentation on, on the future of fulfillment and international expansion. So Hans, uh, before we actually get to talk uh, to, you know, to your topic, maybe you can give us a little introduction uh, of yourself and, uh, we, and then we'll get at it. Sure. <clears throat> thanks, Carlos, and thanks again for the invitation for for this event, uh, which I would have loved to be able to attend, you know, uh, physically. But but due to the recent changes that uh, my family and I has been relocated to Vancouver, this is where I am in this not right now in this moment, but where I will when you. in terms of, of questions about the film group afterwards is my absence so um just in brief um i have been with the logistics industry for yeah, approximately 24 years a bit more than that um worked for five different types of companies has been worked for been living in different parts of the world from denmark to hong kong to amsterdam to switzerland and reasons here last four years in, in denmark and now we are relocating to canada I've uh, been working for the MERSC organization, Agility, Pen and Pina, ESV for a couple of years, and recently, uh, until the end of 2021, I was uh, responsible for Scan Global Logistics, uh, fulfillment and e-commerce activities uh, based out of Denmark. Uh, the last eight, nine months, I've done some consultancy work, and then here recently, it was announced that I'm I'll say, changing, I'll say, industry, in, not industry, so to say, because it's still within the logistics in, uh, environment. However, I'm jumping from the traditional logistics um, world, pre pill world, into the technology sector, uh, which is uh, a, I'll say, um, a more and more influence, uh, I'll say, sector in the logistics industry that technology has done a massive, uh, I'll say, impact, uh, made a massive impact to the industry as well. And I personally, I find that super exciting. Uh, this is driven around the, the consumer and the, and the changes happening not only for, uh, for in the consumer industry, but indeed for logistics and supply chain industry, we're going through a 
a dramatic changes this year. So I got an opportunity to to join that organization, which is a scale up organization, uh, a bit more than five, almost six years old, um, full of uh, energy and a, uh, I'll say a broad international team uh, come from the technology sector and some from the logistics sector who who have won our, I'll say, I'll say innovation is the driver of, of that organization, which I'm kind of inspired about. So amazing. Yeah. So Personally, I'm yeah. married to uh, uh, Colleen, my wife. So she's mm -hmm. Canadian, and we have two uh, kids, Sebastian, I'm seven, and Isabella, I'm five. Perfect. Thanks for sharing, Hans. Hans, let's not let's then get to to your topic. Then the topic of this presentation, which is why you know what's what's going on in in the logistics. Uh, Of the traditional logistics providers uh, who do ocean freight and air freight, uh, buyers consolidation, supply chain services, etc., popped up because there was a need for that because of the retail uh, industry and the big box uh, model, etc. Um, so there has been a lot of it's interesting to, to to see how logistics company has arisen according to the current need or, or the need during that time. Over the last, I don't know, two to five years, in particular the last two years, two and a half years. Uh, there's been a lot of new companies coming up to the surface, which all have either a sustainable or technology approach to the business. And these are the ones who's really, I'll say, I'll say, forcing a quicker change uh, in the logistics industry than maybe the logistics industry is. I'm looking at it is able to capture with, um, because it's not only becoming a volume game, uh, which is the traditional, I'll say, uh, logistics mindset uh, of it. Um, it's becoming more important what you're able to support from you know the consumers in the back in the very end of supply chain services and that has nothing to do with the ocean freight and air freight that has something to do with value added services uh, around fulfillment services about uh, um, uh, how you want to get delivered in 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 how far and can it get returned there's a lot of different kind of elements where logistics i'll say services have popped up uh, which are trying to create more value to the importers or to the retailers or the brands themselves, um, which is very difficult to do that out of air freight and ocean freight. Um, so that has become more and more powerful 
uh, and that will continue to go in that way around. And this is how I'm, I'm, I'm seeing that in a nutshell, that the logistics industry are changing faster than ever before, which is driven by the consumers because all brands and retailers are trying to adapt to these kind of uh, changing buying behaviors. I, I find it fascinating. And I will ask you then, what are the main changes? Because uh, you, you mentioned some sort of, let's call them ancillary services to the main offering of a logistic company. Mm -hmm. So the ancillary services could be a service like yours, which is international expansion and warehousing, you know, at, at a click of a button. What other services you're seeing uh, that can really help logistics companies and brands? Because the brands actually, at the end of the day, and the companies, they have to adapt to the consumer behavior, right? So That's right. Uh, can you perhaps comment a little bit on, 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 the, on the services that you're seeing in the marketplace? Um, it is the fact that because of all the changes or the fast changes the brands are experienced because of they're trying to adapt to these, I'll say, consumer buying behaviors, it's going so fast. Of course, they have to outsource uh, a lot of those activities, uh, you know, to, to other companies. And, and some of them uh, are actually within the logistics space. Um, it's just not all logistics companies kind of maybe considering <laughs> That's actually going to be their future as a job in order to, to support that. But it's it, it's very minor about speed, flexibility, um, understand of uh, local cultures, meaning you were able in order to I'll say fulfill in order to live up to the local to the standard locally. And, and it's based on the fact that many brands in these years have a lot of focus on international expansions. Um, can't serve the entire world from one location as a brand. You need to be closer to where your consumers are, where the retail stores are, uh, in order to do that. And as it, it is, is, is quite clear to many is that the, the, the change that the buying behaviors are the way are quite different from country to country. And there's also a big difference within the country. So in order to live up to those, I'll say, expectations and needs in these areas, some want the sustainable way. Take an example um high-end fashion brand uh the women brand without mentioning any name it kind of go along on that side they would like to also grow their sales and they would like to try to reach out in, in various types of uh corner uh, of, of of the world and, and and then also individually in the countries take a place like uh, the uk um the consumers in, for instance, the London area, London city areas, there's more likely those uh, persons would like to have the options to get deliveries uh, several times throughout the day. Uh, some in the evening, some would actually be preferring because they're buying it's an experience. They want to get it on, on, you know, on the uh, sustainable way. They want to on an electric bike or just a bike or, or something like that. Um, and they're willing to pay a little bit more for it. Uh, go a bit further up north, or maybe a few hours up north, maybe not an any name, but let's say in the northern part of England. The needs for that is not happening, um, but it's still within the same kind of countries. And there's also something to do about, are we looking at global expansion? Yes, we have tendency to talk about countries and countries, but in reality, it's the cities, which is the powerhouses, right? And, and I'm not mentioning anything, but the country you're coming from, Carlos, right? There's a couple of cities whose base are the main driver financially of that country. That's the scenario you have in most countries. So, so not even about just because you know the, for instance, in this particular case, the UK consumers. There's very there's a big difference between the UK consumers within the UK, and in order to live up to that, you need to really, really deeply understand how these persons are buying their products and and stuff, and then adjust to that. Meaning, back to the delivery, you need to. It'll say have a long range of delivering options because some want the fast, some want the cheap, some want the green way, some want deliver in the evening. Uh, there's value added services like um, uh, return, uh, okay, preparing, they're now just clothing, for instance, like that. Value added service to, to, to face clothes, which has been uh, broken or something like that. There's a lot of long, long list of that. You see platforms coming to the table. Uh, these years, um, particularly one I've had some some uh, also some experience with a company called uh, Create to Stay, who was creating uh, an interesting, uh, I'll say, platform for brands for for second hand. In a nutshell, you need to be, if, you know, and again, the lady fashion does apparently uh, 
a uh, trend that that many women only use a dress once or twice. So um, give them the opportunity to sell back their dress to the brand online and then getting about to buy something else on their website. You can't do that without having a logistic service. Like you need to send that piece of clothing back to, to where it comes from. They need to be washed and clean and need to be sold. That's a fulfillment order and, and distribution side. You can't do that. And it's really the uh, the few logistics providers in, in this kind of space who really are geared to to handle these kind of things. So so there's a lot of push from new, I'll say new niche newcomer within these space who's specializing in that because they really put the consumers first in everything that they do. And that is what I consider and challenge in the logistics industry dramatically these years. Fantastic. And I think it's interesting because I, 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 well, we've spoken a few times and I actually, mm. uh, I, I have to say that I've learned a lot uh, about the logistics industry overall, just, you know, uh, just, just by talk, uh, from talking to you. But I also had a, a, an experience, re, um, an opportunity to talk to the guys, from Project 44, for example, yeah. uh, recently was also amazing what they're doing, yes. which, which makes me think that I mean, logistics as an industry, they, I don't know if it will change much, but what will change them is this ancillary uh, services and technology. So we're, we're actually talking about a new wave, right, of technologies that, that are uh, taking over and, and actually supporting uh, how the industry can adapt to the consumer. So the question mm -hmm. I have then for you is like, what's the role of technology and partnerships in this new era that we're living me personally i think that's everything it is everything uh, we don't have to go that many years back where all early every logistics companies for instance or even brands trying to build their own technology i know there's still some out there doing that or trying to do that but see if you take in consideration there's there's uh, i think more than 90 percent of the context of the world wide web is less than three years old um and and let's just go faster and faster and faster. You as a company, and particularly the logistics company, not a technology kind of company, you need to integrate, and you can't be big in 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 that part either. I think it's very important that no matter what industry you're in, whether there's logistics or there's clothing or pharmacy or whatever it is, maybe you maybe start to stay focused what you're good at, and technology has come here to stay. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I think we will see a continued. Uh, push uh, on, on that it'll be more and more important uh, technology will to a certain extent take over a lot of ex uh, functionalities was happening today I'm, i have no no doubt about that and um i think it's more about to adapting to these changes and that's come to do with integrations uh, and if you can do figure out to integrate through technology into i'll say local expertise or niche expertise instead of being able to, to do it all uh, then i think you kind of have you know, really found a a, a smart way of uh, of of, of uh, I'll say a future a long term business model uh, instead of trying to you want to do it all you want to own everything and you want to I'll say uh, win everything and, and that size doesn't really that's really not really what the customer is asking for so they don't really care as much about that today. Technology for me then I know it is is important and I'm not only thinking about that you also see that when you are in for instance, in, in fulfillment centers or warehouses around the world, uh, there's some massive difference between those operations. Uh, and uh, some of them are extremely automated. Uh, that technology comes into that. Again, if you couldn't take that and integrate that with with, with other parts in the logistics sector uh, or do the supply chain, it, it's, it's that's the that's the way of going. It, these days where, you know, you, you're managing See, logistics is based on history and without thinking about the future these days are, are over uh, in, in in my book uh, and and these are not the long these are not the win in the long race you know for the answer I, when it comes to yeah, technology no, no. as well totally. I, yeah. I, I considering like you know, one thing is integration another thing is visibility mm -hmm. uh, is you know you need the visibility and that's is required from the brands um and and whether that's the the PO management or SKU level from inbound supply chain but it's uh, indeed also very much connected to the to the last mile activities as well so um, have the visibility in this very complex um and uh, I'll say challenging time uh, we in in terms of logistics whether it's the unpredictable 
ocean freight uh, services to sky high rates, uh, air freight wise or road or bunker fees, etc. Like there's a lot of changes going on right now. And um, a lot of companies are also changing sourcing patterns uh, these years because there are certain things happening out in the world that don't want to be, I'll say, take on certain risks that they historically did. Um, so you change around that. And then again, back to the talk we had about the consumers as well. There's a lot of change in the front end too. Um, when you were having so many things going on at the same time, uh, you need control or need to have the access, uh, at least to, 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 as a need the visibility to, to all these different kinds of functions and uh, having true on supply chain. So you need the technology for the visibility reasons as well there. That's very interesting, Hans. Um, what, so how is it that Fulfillment Group is uh, helping other businesses? And I'm actually very curious because it seems that you have brands as customers, but also logistics companies as well. So it's not a one-way thing, right? It's, it's, it's yeah. actually quite interesting. The, uh, the business model should be interesting. Perhaps if you can tell us one or two business cases, not necessarily mentioning names, but how you, you, you solved specific pains, you know, like um, that would be interesting to, to hear and for the audience as well. Yes, of course, but just make this short uh, and, and Ben maybe will be able to, to answer some of those questions in, in my absence anyway, but 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 you're right. Uh, the, the company has gone through a number of well, changes or since its beginning um, and uh, has been have a, both customers in the 3PL side of it, uh, logistics companies who have warehouses or fulfillment operations in their home countries, but having customers um, in the house who want to do interna international expansion. So basically what they want or what they need, they need warehouse in new areas. And the uh, fulfillment group is a, among others, a, a network of, of uh, I'll say, uh, fulfillment certified or fulfillment operators around the world, um, all from Asia to Australia, New Zealand, Africa, Middle East, North America, and a number of places in Europe. Um, and that's of course the technology which is connecting you know uh, these three PLs, warehouse management systems, or there to 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 other uh, partners in around the world in order to be able to to serve their customers' needs for for um, for, for growing internationally in new markets as well. That's one thing. Um, the other thing is that uh, the company indeed also have uh, I'll say software clients in terms of brands, uh, brands who are exactly what they want. They want to grow in new markets. Um, they and there's a lot of also some they're both big and small um, I love without mentioning any names but but it's it's an interesting value prop for also the smaller and mid-sized companies because uh, historically it used to be only the big companies who could get out internationally and, and, and because they have deep pockets that's not the case any longer um, this I'll just set up here is, is based like you know you we, we help brand uh, to, to find those, uh, I'll say, fulfillment local operators who live up to those needs uh, they, they need in those new markets they're opening up and really integrating arm uh, between those. So we, we have a relatively long list um, of, uh, I'll say, criteria for these partners we are working with around the, uh, around the world because as you, of course, mm -hmm. can imagine, it's not all warehouse operators who are good at everything so it's also our job trying to identify those partners within our network who can serve those needs which is required from brands directly and there's no doubt about that the brands are quite i'll say they're on the ball around this at the moment um, and we also realize that logistics company there are some who are indeed taking this as the, the core of the business and there's also this is coming who considering this being like an, an add-on to the existing business. And then that's the priority is also the fulfillment group uh, organization going through right now in order to make sure that it, it has to be the core of the business in order to, you know, to, to invest in it. Because that's really where the changes are happening. I understood. Yeah. Fantastic. So the, the, trend, the trend is really spreading out mm -hmm. hops, right? Warehouse up uh, to get closer to the customer. So that's what it is. All right, Hans, I think you shared a lot of knowledge today. I'd like to thank you. Maybe you want to, uh, you know, give some final sh uh, considerations. Also, leave your, your contact information um, if people want to, to get in touch. And yeah. Uh, I, my contact information, I don't know. Maybe yeah, I mean, on, on LinkedIn or, or the fulfillment group. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. But I'll, I'll let the, 
I'll let you. I'll share that afterwards. But but uh, but Perfect. let's do that. I'm not going to sit in here and share that right now. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. Yeah, I can I, I I can also share in the in uh, on the chat. No problem. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, cool. Yeah, but otherwise, thanks again, for Carlos, for for the opportunity. And uh, again, apologize I couldn't be there. We uh, love to be part of like, these uh, say live discussions uh, instead of me just sitting here telling a story um, That's so, fine. about it. But um, I appreciate the opportunities, and uh, I, um, you know, embrace change. That's very nice. Thanks very much. Thank you. Am I live again? Yes, I am live. So that was Hans Elmegaard. Uh, perhaps, Ben, you can jump in uh, for a few minutes here sure. with me. Sure. Thank you very much. And thank you again, Ben, for, for, for doing this. Amazing. Ben, I, I actually have a question on, because I always talk to Hans and I find this conversation very uh, insightful, you know, mm -hmm. uh, about the future of logistics industry. Uh, and maybe I, I, would I would love to hear your take as well. I, I spoke recently with the guys from Project 44, which is mm -hmm. another tech mm -hmm. company doing some interesting stuff in terms of tracking and visibility and, and, and really like what I see in terms of the future of logistics is, is are the services, right? As I said, ancillary services during the, the live uh, so you can create the strategic partnerships, move faster. But I would love to, to have your take on this. Yeah, I think, you know, my take on it would be that we're going to see it's, it's you know, we're going to see a um, a move away from fragmentation and sort of black spots in the in the supply chain through to a more sort of cohesive um, approach to this. And, and technology is going to be the, the enabler for that. So at the moment, we have these sort of services around visibility in certain areas, integration in certain areas, but they are piecing together what is still a very fragmented, fra fragmented supply chain. Um, I think over the next few years, we'll start to see all of that come together and we'll see more and more services that provide total visibility end to end, whether that's from the supplier to consumer and everything in between, and increased control as well. Um, and flexibility, so the, so the, it will enable brands um, to kind of mitigate risk quite easily by you know changing partners um, changing providers but still maintaining that sort of level of visibility and control because at the moment a lot of it is still based on uh, you know you, you you hand over your inventory to a carrier or a warehouse or something in between whether that's even a final final mile carrier and it's kind of then you're kind of waiting then for the next step it's kind of in a black spot still until it's delivered or it arrives at the warehouse. So plug in those gaps, I think, as well. will be. I have another question to follow up. Why if choosing a partner can be a challenge? Uh, and forgive me if it's a stupid question, but... Oh, uh, no, no, of course. You, you know. I think, um, well, we'll define partner in, you know, the sort of the area that we deal with. So a partner in, in our area would be a, a warehouse fulfillment provider. Um, that's a challenge because, well, there's two things, really. The first is, um, you may not be familiar with the the country or the region in which you need a partner. So if you're, let's say, uh, Hans used the UK as an example. If you're a UK brand and you need a partner in North America, well, you may not be particularly familiar with the North American market, especially the providers there. You could ask for recommendations from people, um, but it's a bit of a scary process in, in a lot of respects because the second part is you're handing your inventory over to this partner. So you're essentially giving the lifeblood of your business to this third party provider who you may not even know. Um, so there's a fair amount of risk associated with that. And the quality of partners can vary massively market to market and even in market region to region. So it's a really important, um, it's a really important process. So therefore the challenge there is, well, that's really why it is so important, right? You're handing your inventory over to them. It's the core of your, your business. Fantastic, thank you. We have a question from Anas, and uh, he asks, to which extent do you believe that increasing visibility will be a parameter which customers are willing to pay price premium for, or will it be a qualifier to operate? I think it's just, it's just gonna be the barrier to entry. It's gonna be like the standard. Um, I think it's a bit of a premium now. So if you take something like, um, 
you know, uh, Project 44, as, as you mentioned, Carlos, um, there's a price tag associated with that level of visibility there um, on the freight side in particular. Um, but that will but that will just become a standard expectation in future. It will no longer be a premium. I feel it will become um, just a standard requirement and part of it'll just be a feature of a number of features required by brands and companies um, in their supply chain, their providers. Amazing. Ben, thank you very much for your participation. Learned a lot as well. Thanks for your thought leadership thank you. and thank you. Uh, thanks. Take care. Thanks. thanks. Bye. 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 All right, moving next now we have Rafael Berti. He's the founder of Paragon. And Paragon is a, a, a super interesting agency. They focus only on Amazon and international expansion. Rafael is going to be talking and uh, is going to be explaining how brands and companies in the, in the B2B space, they take advantage of Amazon to expand into new markets. So uh, moving up to uh, Rafael, because we, are, we, are, we, are, we need to be on time. So uh, Rafa, you're up next. Hello, everyone, and um, I'm very happy to be here today and very glad to be speaking at this event. Um, thank you very much, Carlos and Paul, for inviting me today. Um, most of you must know Amazon's early marketplace. Uh, you all perhaps know it by the ISE and perhaps worldwide, most of you in the US. But I'm certain uh, some of you may not know all or be aware of all the B2B opportunities that you may have with Amazon. So I'm here to talk a little bit about them today. Um, these are very large topics, so I'm going to have to simplify. Very happy to be here today and very glad to be speaking at this event. Um, thank you very much, Carlos and Evolve, for inviting me today. Um, most of you must know Amazon for its marketplace or perhaps you know it by the IT infrastructure they provide called AWS. But I'm certain uh, some of you may not know all or be aware of all the B2B opportunities that you may have with Amazon. So I'm here to talk a little bit about them today. Um, these are very large topics, so I'm going to have to simplify and just give an overview about what they are. Of course, we can talk more in depth in a private conversation later on. First off, I just wanted to say that I'm the founder and CEO of Paragon, a full service agency specialized in, on, on Amazon. And we provide support on operations, marketing, training, and consulting. We also serve customers all over Europe, North America. And this month, actually, we launched in Brazil. I must mention we're also part of the Amazon uh, SPN, the service provider network, and Amazon Ads Partner Agency. Our agency is relatively new. Uh, we've been in the market since 2020, but our team has been working with Amazon for a very long time. So if you need expertise of very experienced people, don't hesitate to come after us. And I'll be taking questions during the Q&A session after my presentation. So back to the topic I wanna, I wanna be presenting today. Um, I wanna talk about three major B2B oppor opportunities that I think businesses should be aware of. The first one is called Amazon Business. Um, a couple of years back, Amazon surpassed Google as the default search engine customers use to find products. Although this is true mainly in the US market, we can also see a similar trend here in Europe. This means that when people think of buying something, they immediately hop onto Amazon Marketplace first. Um, the two biggest drivers of this type of behavior, I'd say number one is price which in turn, which, which turns Amazon into the largest price comparison website on the internet. Amazon is a very big price follower, meaning it scans the internet for the best deals they find online. And then they try to match the prices from other websites on their catalog. That's Amazon's way of attracting shoppers to the marketplace. 
The second driver is the feedback on products. This, a, this was a turning point on e-commerce and in my opinion is the reason why Amazon is as big as it is today. That's because product feedback gave the power back to customers by letting them measure their own return on investment, let's say. So, so letting them measure how much they're getting for the money they invested. And this rewards uh, product quality rather than marketing quality. This also falls in line with Amazon's philosophy of being a customer-centric company. Because of these two factors, uh, companies, in especially in special small businesses, they also started uh, using Amazon as the place to go for purchasing. They were looking for items in IT products, which is microphones, video conference cameras, projectors, etc., but also stationary office supplies like pen, paper, staplers, whatever. Um, professional tools, drills, screwdrivers, DIY tools in general, and cleaning products. Amazon saw this as an opportunity um, to launch the Amazon Business Program to effectively create a B2B space for sellers and buyers at a, at a business level. So who uses Amazon Businesses uh, business nowadays? Amazon describes their ideal client as uh, sole traders, large enterprises, um, governments, schools, healthcare organizations, but the list is unlimited. Here at Paragon, we have a few clients that are using, uh, are subscribed as a seller on um, Amazon Business, and this program has been a big contributor on driving revenue. Uh, one of our clients is in the automotive, automotive uh, category, selling car parts, and about 30% of its sales actually comes from Amazon Business. What makes it so special in comparison with regular sales to consumers? Amazon offers a few perks for selling partners enrolled on the Amazon Business Program, in particular, in particular regarding automation. So I put together a list of uh, some of the features that, uh, that are very important. First one being pay by invoice. For buyers, this means that they can select invoice as a payment method. For sellers, Amazon will take care of issuing the invoice on their behalf. Quote requests. You may allow business uh, businesses uh, business customers to request a quantity discount on specific products. VAT calculation is basically Amazon uh, doing the calculation for VAT on your behalf, which makes it easy to report to tax authorities. B2B versus B2B data. You will be able to measure how much of your business is coming from uh, another business uh, customer. And this data can be coupled with um, marketing efforts to reach more business customers later on. And you have the reorder lists. Amazon let buyers uh, create a list of products they are reordering automatically in cycles. This is in essence a subscription model where you get recurring purchases from a customer. So what I usually say as my number one advice for anyone that wants to sell on Amazon is to never run out of stock. If I had to sum up what Amazon business is, um, I would use their Amazon's own definition, which is a, a professional procurement solution that helps a small, medium, and enterprise corporations digitize and automate um, procurement for their organizations. Amazon recently shared some numbers on their Accelerate events last week. Um, let me share these numbers. So you, you, you're seeing these numbers here now. The the Amazon business encompasses over uh, 1 million customers account, um, customer accounts worldwide and over 150,000 sellers and more than $10 billion in global annualized sales. As I said, these numbers are fresh um, just from last week and they show the potential of the program and I don't think it should be overlooked. To get started with Amazon business is very simple. Have an, effect, an active and professional seller account, seller central account and then all you need to do is to activate the Amazon business tools at no extra cost. Should you enroll your, uh, your brand on the program? My answer is it depends on the type of product you sell. But in most cases, even non-traditional office products like cosmetics, for example, could have the potential. Some businesses may be interested to order your products in bulk as a gift to employees or customers or maybe a small brick and mortar retailers might be interested to have your products on their shelves so they use your Amazon account as their distributor. Enrolling in the program is free of charge anyway, so unless you have a very strict, um, a, a very tight distribution strategy that you want to follow, I'll say it's worth a try. 
that was the first B2B opportunity with Amazon I recommend businesses to be aware of. The second one, most of you might have heard of, it's called Amazon Vendor Central. This program was initially designed for brands and manufacturers, although later distributors were also allowed to join. Amazon Vendor Central is the way Amazon bridges the gap between manufacturers and dis distributors to help them get their products to the end consumer. In other words, you're acting as a supplier, selling in bulk to Amazon, who then resells your products to consumers. If you sell your product, products uh, via Vendor Central, you're called a first party seller or 1P for short. Amazon also conceived the Vendor Central program as a way to add more products to their product mix or assortment, bringing a whole variety of products to the Amazon catalog. Vendor uh, Central also serves Amazon as a way to curb certain restrictions imposed by brands, enabling Amazon to get hold of hot products that brands and manufacturers don't want to sell to Amazon. Some brands have a negative view on Amazon about how about the way Amazon handles their brand, so they decided not to engage with Amazon at any level. I personally think that this is a harsh behavior and is the result of poorly understanding how Amazon works. But I'll leave this discussion for another time. Are there benefits of selling on Vendor Central? Yeah, what, which ones are these benefits? The first one I would say I'll point it out is simplicity because the core process of, uh, of selling on Vendor Center is, very, is actually very simple. Uh, Amazon um, issues a, a purchase order to you. You send the inventory to them. Amazon pays you. That's it. So unlike Seller Central, you focus on a single client rather than many, and you're selling in bulk. So most, for, for the most part, it's just a normal B2B sales. Consumer confidence. Because of... Um, Products will be sold and shipped by Amazon. Consumers are more likely to purchase, to, to purchase uh, trusting that Amazon has elected or has sourced uh, the products from a trustworthy um, source, right? In the early days of trading on Amazon, I remember I, uh, there was a kid uh, who bought a PlayStation and inside the box, there was a huge stone instead. Unfortunately, cases like this were, it still happen. And... Um, not not as often as it used to be, but in, in what what is happening is here is that um, customers are, are looking for you know they, they they trust Amazon they trust that Amazon is working with with uh, with suppliers that are actually delivering product and they're not going to find a stone inside the box. Talking about <laughs> about boxes, the the third uh, advantage is also the buy box. Um, since Amazon will be handling the customers on your behalf there is a greater chance that you will be winning the buy box more often. Um, that, of course, if you are not the only seller to your product, but this is both a good thing and a bad thing, depending on your agreements with resellers. I'll discuss the negative side of uh, in, in the next slide, but, but for now, I'm going to limit myself by saying that winning the buy box will generate more sales for you, and that's a positive thing. So are there any disadvantages to sellers for sellers on Vendor Central? I wouldn't actually call it disadvantages, but these are things that sellers need to be aware of and should have a strategy in place to counter any negative experience these factors can cause. The first one being price control. When you sell your goods to Amazon, they basically own the product. And just like any other merchants, they, they can do whatever they like with the products they own. Amazon has no obligation to follow a MAP or MSRP. Amazon's pricing strategy is heavily dependent on data collected from the internet, basically scanning other retailers that sell the same product and then cutting the competition. Amazon is a price follower. It goes with the price it sees in the market. So as I said, this is not necessarily a bad thing because lower prices tend to boost uh, sales. But I don't want um, to. But but if you don't want to get caught in the situation where Amazon is selling your products at a ridiculously low prices, I suggest you look at your distribution in your entire supply chain because those low prices are coming from somewhere. The uh, there are logistical requirements. Amazon has produced guidelines that vendors need to follow when delivering their products to Amazon, because everything on Amazon warehouses is automated. Amazon has very strict protocols on how the incoming goods are offloaded. Delays and mistakes on delivery will generate fees. And talking about fees, we have the, the third disadvantage would be the chargebacks. 
after you sign a vendor agreement, Amazon expects a certain level of, of professionalism from your end. Amazon operations are highly automated and they expect you to keep up. This doesn't necessarily mean that you have to automate your warehouse, but it does mean a certain level of precision. For this reason, Amazon implemented chargebacks, which are small fees deducted to from, from the vendor's uh, sale as a penalty for non-compliance. Chargebacks, however, are extremely important to keep an eye on because if, if, they, if, if they're too many, then they can cripple your entire operation and damage your prof profitability. So what kinds of chargebacks are there? There are quite a few, but basically anything from mislabeling, incorrect assortment, incorrect box or pallet size, uh, damaged products, stock not arriving on time. These are all reasons for Amazon to apply chargeback fee. We usually recommend that when you sign with the vendor program, it is a good idea to quickly find out what are Amazon's requirements for delivering your products to them, and then start training your warehouse staff to handle Amazon orders. Once again, I'd like to emphasize that these are not necessarily drawbacks of trading with Amazon, but you must be able to keep up with Amazon's speed of doing business if you want a fruitful partnership. Here at Paragon, by the way, we offer training and support if you require. Then the last thing to say about the vendor program is how to start. A vendor program is unfortunately an invitation only program. That means that the interest must start from Amazon and uh, they need to reach out to you to offer the possibility of selling your products to them. How does this happen? Well, vendor managers are uh, working on Amazon. They have the priority to grow their categories. So they are always on the lookout for interesting products to add to the mix. If your brand has been trading for some years and have acquired a certain level of reputation nation nationwide, or if your products are already pr present on the shelves of uh, some main retailers, it is very likely that someone from vendor program will reach out to you if they haven't done it already. For smaller brands, you need to work your way up before you would be considered to join the program. The best way is to start on Seller Central, work on your metrics from there, grow your sales and then and your brand voice on category and then you might stand a chance. Can companies in the Nordic countries be invited to the vendor program? The answer is absolutely yes. In fact, we have some clients from Denmark who are taking advantage of the vendor program, typically getting an invitation to start in Germany and then later expanding to other EU markets. And then the last B2B opportunity I'd like to present to you today is something called, is, it's the Amazon ads. More specifically, the, I'm talking about the Amazon DSP part of the ads. We already talked about Amazon Business and the vendor program, which are both part of the retail side of Amazon. Amazon DS, DSP is part of the advertising side of Amazon. Um, in this slide, you can see a little bit clearly, um, a little bit better which part of Amazon I'm referring to. Amazon ads in general is divided in two groups. So you have the sponsored ads and DSP. In a nutshell, sponsor ads are those ads that appear within the Amazon Marketplace website. These traditional ads that, those traditional ads that sellers use to drive traffic within the marketplace to their products. DSP on the other hand is the top of funnel advertising. And the main difference between DSP to sponsor ads is that it allows advertisers to reach audiences inside and outside of the marketplace. In Amazon's own words, Amazon DSP is a demand side platform that allows you to programmatically buy ads to reach new and existing audiences on and off Amazon. So let me break this down a little. For those of you who are not familiar with the marketing lingo, a demand side platform is basically a system that allow advertisers to buy digital advertising space in an automated way. Your ads can appear on all of the Amazon properties, which includes IMDb, uh, Prime Video, Prime Music, and Twitch, and even hardwares like Kindle and Fire Stick, for example. DSP is very useful for sellers that want to bring external traffic from outside the Amazon marketplace to their products, uh, product pages on Amazon. For certain categories, this is a no brainer because the competition on the marketplace is very fierce or because the pool of visitors to that specific category is very limited or very small. So using Amazon DSP with a um, sponsor ad gives you a full funnel marketing strategy. This is particularly interesting as well uh, for retargeting cap capabilities, uh, letting advertisers retarget people who have shown interest 
in your brand at a certain point in time. Uh, Amazon DSP is a powerful tool because it lets you combine the buying preferences information Amazon has on customers with the media publishers where your target audience are more li likely it are more likely to be interacting. Now, the coolest thing about Amazon DSP, in my opinion, is that you don't need to be an Amazon seller to use the DSP for advertising. So businesses like insurance companies, credit card companies, airlines, automakers, or car dealers, and different types of businesses in other industries, they can all use Amazon DSP to reach their audience and bring traffic to their website. How is, um, how is Amazon DSP relevant on B2B? Well, because of the shift that we have seen that led Amazon to create things like Amazon Business, for example, just like, uh, consumers, business, just like consumers, business are accepting buying online as part of, uh, part of life. So B2B buyers are starting to display the same behavior as consumers and now use online channels to purchase B2B products. This means the majority of B2B vendors no longer um, need to put, put all their efforts into reaching buyers one by one as they used to be, you know, calling them on the phone and asking if they want to buy, the, buy their products. Instead, what vendors uh, need, need to do is to increase the popularity of their brand by increasing awareness among B2B buyers and present the right information where their target audience will see it. And then online buyers will do the rest. Amazon advertising can support brands that want to reach B2B customers with the use of Amazon B2B audiences. B2B audiences gives brands the opportunity to reach out B2B customers at a scale across Amazon's owned uh, and operated inventory, which are the Amazon websites I previously mentioned, and across Amazon uh, DSP. These audiences are based on Amazon first party data and are available to any brands who wish to reach B2B customers across digital channels. Amazon advertising audience uh, capabilities use billions of shopping and viewing signals to help uh, advertisers reach the most relevant audiences for their business. And that concludes my presentation. I hope you were able to get some useful information from it. I'll be taking questions during our Q&A session in uh, just a few moments. And before I go, I just wanted to say that um, I mentioned that Amazon. Uh, we had a um, we had an event with Amazon last week, and Amazon announced some very cool and exciting tools and changes they're doing on the platform, both on the retail and the and the advertising side. And I think these are uh, this is a very interesting um, moment to actually start dealing with Amazon. So if you have any interest, if you want to if you want to know more about this, you can get in touch with us. Thank you very much for, uh, for listening, and I'll talk to you in a bit. All right, Hafa, thank you for this. Uh, Hafa will be joining us for, for a bit. Well done with your presentation. Really nice. Thank you. Thank we, you. we were talking about your slides. They look great, man. Oh, thank, <laughs> you much. thank you very much. Uh, we have to thank our designer for doing that. I'm, don't, yeah. I'm not doing this my, myself. <laughs> uh, it, it looks great. I have one question for you, and the question yeah. is, what is the common enemy today for you? If you, when we we are talking about international expansion for brands, you told me about once about the example of Nike pulling off um, Amazon, right? Yeah, they they, they, they they removed off. all their products from Amazon. They decided not to sell on Amazon anymore. Yeah, yeah. and and there's there 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 are a bunch of challenges like there when it comes to. Uh, you know, aligning price. We spoke about this once, right? Because a, a, a brand like Nike probably has some challenges when it comes to to the other sales channels that they have. So perhaps you you could comment on this. I, I find this really interesting how brand, how how brands can actually and and B two B companies as well if they want to expand via Amazon, uh, you know, have this alignment so they understand that well. Uh, they're not the distributors. They're not going to to suffer. You know, like but how do you do that, right? And mm. Yeah, the, the Nike case is a very interesting case because, um, you know, it's a very huge brand that decided to uh, be completely away from um, Amazon. And uh, but there are other examples of other brands that have done the same here in Europe. We have uh, Dyson, for instance, they decided not to sell or engage with Amazon in any level. Um, but the, the, the interesting thing about that is that no matter what, Nike is still a very much searched uh, key term 
on on Amazon. So people are still looking for Nike products on Amazon. And still, if you if you go on Amazon there, you can still find Nike products. So inevitably, their products are still there. And, you know, either because Amazon or some reseller, someone will find a way to put the products there because there is a demand. Obviously, Nike wants to have control over their branding. They want to have control over the price. I think in the case of Nike, it, it, when they left, it was mostly because of uh, uh, the lack of control over uh, counterfeit products that they were having. And uh, that was a major issue. Amazon has addressed that to some level. They have improved quite a lot. That's part of the reasons why Amazon created the, the brand registry that allows brands to actually uh, tell uh, uh, tell Amazon when there's a, that there could be a, a seller that who are, is not authorized by the brand to sell the product on the on the marketplace, or they could be selling counterfeit, or could be selling whatever the reason, anything that could be damaging or harming the brand in any way. Um, they, this is what the brand registry is for. So Amazon has improved. I mean, I've been trading on Amazon for so many years now, and like I said, Amazon has announced so many improvements. Uh, lately, that uh, things that are coming up, and uh, also next year, this year and next year. So we're really looking forward to to what's coming up. But uh, back to your question, the 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 common challenge is that what I see in our trade is that we get businesses they are they understand that the, the value or they understand the um, the weight that Amazon has in the market, uh, especially in the online sales but they don't really understand how to work with it. They don't understand, you know, Rene was actually mentioning it on, on his presentation. He was talking about how brands are so, you know, so the, people are so willing to invest on, on logistics, uh, on, on automating warehouse, but when they talk about automating their e-commerce, they're just like, oh, I don't know how to do that because this is a very traditional um, sector that does not, you know, they, they, they're still very old school. They still treat, uh, uh, um, they're, they're still treating sales in a very uh, old school way. And um, so they never really addressed or understood uh, how to build an e-commerce team, right? I was, uh, back when I started in e-commerce, e-commerce was still a new thing. And what I saw was like uh, re retailers suddenly understanding that, you know, uh, marketplaces, especially uh, at my time, that was eBay, and, and also uh, Amazon were still beginning, but eBay was the most relevant uh, player in Europe at that time. And retailers suddenly they they recognize, okay, we need to have a website. We need to we need to um, we need to, to to start selling on the marketplaces. So they quickly started like uh, hiring uh, e-commerce managers out of nowhere. You know, there was no, there's no school for e-commerce manager. There was no training or anything. There's basically uh, people coming from marketing or from sales were taking charge of it. And or sometimes from IT, even they were taking the 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 the, the job of actually driving the sales online, and um, and that, but that thing evolved. And um, what happened is is the B two B side of it is still catching up with this movement, right? So that's the common challenge, really. That's the, the that's the biggest challenge we have at the moment. Papa, brilliant. I gotta cut you off now because we have a presentation coming next. I would like to thank you very much. Uh, incredible presentation. Thank you for putting the effort. It was great to have you here, and uh, you. I'm sure we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do more of it. So thanks. I appreciate. It. Thank you very much. Take care. All right. So coming up next, and now I have someone with me who's gonna be joining us soon. He's uh, I'm actually uh, I'm at the Implement Consulting Group Studio. Amazing facilities here, and Anas Heffel. <laughs> Did I pronounce it right? <laughs> Perfect. He will be talking about creating uh, strong value propositions. And I find that topic amazing, incredible, because creating a value proposition isn't something trivial. You really need to understand your stakeholders. You re really need to understand your clients. And so there is a, a lot of research that needs to be done, listening to your clients in order to understand what they actually want so you can craft something valuable. Um, so communication Anas, I'm really excited about what you're going to share here with us. Uh, Anas will be joining us in a minute. So.
I'm on. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, looking forward to uh, talk here. My name is uh, Anas, and I'm from Implement Consulting Group. So, uh, we are more than 1,000 consultants here in Implement, and uh, we are more than 120 people working with uh, any kind of commercial uh, transformations. So, I'm not a tech nerd. I have no clue about the techniques and, uh, and the systems, but uh, I'll try to look at more from a commercial uh, side here. So, when we see companies working with channel strategy or multi-channel strategy or e-commerce strategy or what they call it. We often see that most companies are trying to base their strategy based on what they're already uh, doing. And I once met a clever guy, it was a professor, I think, but he said that if you as a company are doing the, the same as you did two or three years ago, you are in the best case in trouble. Maybe you're even out, but in best case you are behind. And maybe it's not two or three years now, maybe it's now even just a year. So are you doing the same in terms of channels? Are you using the same channels as you did one year ago? You're probably behind. So what I would like to talk a little bit about is, so what characterizes actually the companies that are really good from a commercial point of view to utilize the different channels? And how do you design strong value propositions that fits to the different uh, channels? That's kind of the purpose of my uh, talk. And please just uh, ask uh, any kind of questions in the chat and we will see if we can answer. But before I continue, I found a few numbers that was interesting. And it's not because I would go into a lot of numbers, so just 30 seconds on that one. But looking into the numbers when you do research, and I think that's been mentioned by some of the other speakers, that the market for e-commerce is kind of exploding also within B2B. So, so we believe that the market for B2B e-commerce will heavily increase the coming years. That's not nothing new in that. <laughs> but what kept my interest was the next slide, where, it, where we can see that today, a lot of B2B buyers simply are frustrated with their buying journey. And it might be, as some of the earlier speakers were talking about, it might not be an issue about the systems or the technology. It can be just because they are like me, not very used to do any kind of online uh, purchase. So there can be many reasons uh, for that. But it's also interesting that more than 90% are willing to go to a competitor if they don't find that the experience they get in the channel is uh, at the right level. So here, there's also a huge risk of not of losing your customers if you're not doing it in the right way. So how do we get this uh, right? At least uh, there's a few things that we could touch upon. First one is when you're trying to make your strategy, your channel strategy, you need to see this in a, that things are correlated. So I hear a lot of companies that are talking about we are doing our go-to-market uh, strategy. We are making our go-to-market choices and our channel strategy. And they're seeing this as kind of a, a separate thing. But things are correlated. So in my opinion, you cannot talk about your go-to-market strategy. You cannot talk about your channel strategy without understanding your customers and your customer needs, without making choices around your value proposition, and without making choice, choices around your operating model. So these things are correlated. And if you are changing, and things are systemic. So if you are changing one thing, you need to probably change some of the other things. So you cannot go into a new channel without probably redesigning your value properties and redesigning your operating model because things are correlated. So that, that at least one uh, conclusion uh, here. We were then curious to understand, okay, that sounds really great, and that's a lot of nice consultancy uh, words here, but we are trying to look into what are actually characterized actually than companies that are doing great in a multi-channel setup. And we at least found six best practice examples, and you could probably come up with more, but at least from a commercial point of view, we thought that these were best practice examples when we look at companies that are successful. And this is about, one of them is about putting your customer first, really to understand your customer needs. It's also about managing your channel conflicts proactively, not seeing it as an issue, but trying to take it proactively, understanding that. It's about designing clear value propositions. 
It's about making sure that you have an incentive system that are kind of supporting the use of the new challenge, both externally and internally. It's around, of course, make sure that you have the right digital foundation. This is not about only the tools and the systems, but also the governance structure and, and, the, and the organization below. And then making sure that you have an agile way of working, that you can make fast decisions. And I could probably talk <laughs> half an hour uh, around each of these uh, elements because each element is super interesting uh, to deep dive into. Uh, especially the ones around putting customers first, prototyping, involving your customers, and the other one around channel conflicts at areas where we are, where a lot of our customers are struggling. But today I'm going to focus on the value proposition part. That is something that is really close to my heart and I think is super interesting. So how do you design strong value propositions that fits into the different uh, channels? But what is a strong value proposition? Well, there's probably a lot of definitions and a lot of clever consultants who try to put some buzzwords around that. But fundamentally, a strong value proposition is the answer to the question, why should I as a customer buy your products and services in that specific uh, channel? And that's why a good value proposition has a few characteristics and just to go through them very fast. So of course, a value proposition needs to resonate it needs to make sure that the customer can, can you know, solve their needs. It needs to be built on the needs of your customers. But more, secondly, it also needs to differentiate. It needs to stand out from uh, competition. And thirdly, it needs to be substantial uh, that you can actually prove the value here. And especially the last part about proving the value is extremely important, in my opinion. I see a lot of value propositions where it's all good. It, it, it's a kind of feature you have or a service you have, but are you really able to prove the value for your customers? Let's come back to that one. Besides these three uh, characteristics, I think it makes sense when you talk about value propositions to try to link it to the key questions of your customers. So what are they struggling with? What are the key questions they have? Well, the first question that your customers probably have is, why should I change? Why should I do something differently? Whether the change is to go into another channel and buy your products, or whether it is to, to change the way that he's working in some way, why should I change? And sometimes we underestimate the status quo bias, the value of doing what we have always done. We are, that's how we are as humans. That's how I am I. I don't like to change. I would like to do it in the same way that I've done all the time. And, and our B2B customers have it same. So why change? You need to prove some kind of value for the customers in order to make them change. When you prove that value, they can see the value of changing. But then the next question comes, why you? Why should they then choose you? Why not a competitor? Why should a customer choose DSV and not a competitor? That requires that you are really good at proving how you differentiate and again, being even more specific on the value part. The third question that comes up, then why should I expand? Now I tried to use this channel, buying from you in that B2B channel. Why should I expand? Why should I come up with more? Uh, why should I buy more in, in this uh, channel? And the fourth question, why should I stay? And you need to continuously prove the value to your customers in order to make them stay because you have competitors that are driving a wide change conversation with their customers. So these questions are at least good questions for me to ask yourself uh, when you are trying to build value propositions, uh, whether that's a new channel or a new product uh, or whatever it is. So what is a value proposition and how do we work with the value proposition? Well, we try to make it a little bit simple here. So I believe that a value proposition consists of the number of differentiators. And a differentiator is something that in the eyes of your customers are perceived as unique and perceived as being value created. And the perception part here is critical. So as we discussed in the previous uh, keynote speaker, this about visibility in the supply chain. Could be a differentiator if it's perceived by the customers to be unique and perceived by the customers to create value. It might be that your competitors are doing exactly the same, 
but if you have managed to create that feeling by your cosmos, that there's some kind of uniqueness here. But often it requires that you combine things here. So, this, so the value proposition becomes strong if you combine multiple differentiators. Maybe combining visibility with more flexibility and shorter response time, or what do I know? But you, there's a good way of thinking value propositions around your differentiators and simply starting to map your differentiators. Make a workshop in the leadership team. When you're looking into a new channel, put up some card sport with, you know, what are our differentiators here? What are the potential differentiators? And see what comes up. And then I would use the next model. I would then ask five questions to ourselves. Uh, and you could, and, and if I was in a commercial team in any kind of company, I would have these five questions in all the meetings where we discuss the value proposition, because these are the essential questions that I think you should ask yourself. So if you have a value, a differentiator here, visibility, sustainability, what, flexibility, whatever it is, shorter response time. Of course, it needs to be based on the customer needs, but I, the, the first question I would ask myself was, what is the value equation? What are we, what are we making the customers able to do that they are not able to do today? And what would be the effect for the customer? And that can be on a segment level that you're discussing for this customer segment, what would be the value? And in my opinion, you should be able to calculate that value for that segment. What does visibility mean for them? Does it mean that they have been able to do something towards their customers? Would that make them able to have a higher conversion towards their customers? We need to calculate the exact value on a segment level and on a customer level. And whether that's a value proposition in a specific channel or across channels, that's the same that is going to be applied here. And then the next question would be, great, but how do we stand out for competition? What is the delta to competition? How more visible are we than our competitors? How much is our response time shorter? How more sustainable are we than our competitors? We need to prove this. And when we combine a fact-based approval of our value combined with a fact-based understanding of how we differentiate from competition, we are in a really good place. And that could be channel-specific, segment-segment, even market-specific. Find your way, but be firm on the value creation part. That's really, really essential. So I would ask these questions to myself every time. And by the way, when we work with companies that are really good at this, they put it on the leadership meetings every time they have a leadership meeting, whether that's a functional meeting in the marketing, whether that's a sales leadership meeting, whether that's a, whatever kind of levels you have. The companies that are really great, they have every time an agenda, new customer insights, and they're talking about the value they're creating for their customers and their value proposition. Because as they say, what is more important? If we forget to talk about the value we are creating for our customers, then we are losing something. So instead of only talking about, you know, how good we are doing the results, how we are performing as a company, maybe consider next time to always have something on agenda about what is the value we are creating for our customers. The positive thing is that when we look into different uh, companies here, most companies have something great to offer. So when we talk about the, uh, the, the, our value propositions, I think for most companies, there is a huge value in what we call adjusting your value messages. Being better at proving the value, being better at talking about value around the services we are already doing. Point is, we are probably doing a lot great for our customers that they are simply forgetting to tell the customers about. So if you're going into an e-commerce channel, if we are going into a new uh, channel, we sometimes simply forget to communicate the value we are creating and how we differentiate from uh, competition. Of course, sometimes you also need to develop new services. And that's fine. And that's another ball game. But I would, I would say that in most cases, there's a huge potential in simply adjusting your value messages based on what you're already are uh, offering in the company. So let me sum a little bit up here at the end. I've promised uh, Carlos to be uh, 
not fast, but at least uh, precise. So uh, a few good principles when we talk about commercializing your, uh, your value propositions, whether that is into a new channel or into a new uh, segment. Well, first of all, please be customer centric. Take this outside in perspective. Be really curious about the customer needs in the, across the different uh, segments. Understand the different uh, uh, touch points of your customers, uh, because that is a really, really good uh, start for doing every kind of uh, work. Then design the value propositions on different level, both on a segment level, on a channel level, and even on a customer level, trying to, as we discussed, be really firm on both the value creation part and on the uh, differentiation uh, part. Be obsessed about the customer value, just repeating myself. But we see so many companies that are have so many strong things they're offering, but they're forgetting to talk about the customer uh, value. And do that around the different whys. Be aware of what can, how do we communicate the value if it's a wide change conversation we would like to have. A wide change conversation around how now you should change moving into this new channel. Is it a why you conversation around why should they choose you? Is it a conversation or communication around why should they expand within that specific channel? Or is it more a conversation around why should I stay within this channel? It might be the same value propositions as its core, but the way that you communicate them will be fundamentally uh, different. And then involve your customers. Dare to involve your customers much more than you think. I think it's super cool when you have uh, customers coming into a workshop where you need to present something. What if you prototype something, an e-commerce platform, prototyped it with some, uh, and, and tested it with some of your customers? Inviting your customers in to design their user experience. I think it has so, so much value, and most of your customers are really, really happy about it, and it creates a lot of customer loyalty uh, when you uh, do uh, that. So these were the few guiding principles that could maybe help you to, at least from a commercial point of view, be more firm on the, the value you create for your customers. That was it. All right. Anas, so we're, <laughs> we're, we're here together. That's so nice. <laughs> yeah, and thanks. Uh, no more COVID, so that's also good. Yeah. And as I actually have a question, uh, when it comes to so, thank you very much. I, I find uh, the the your topic super interesting, super relevant. When it comes to to creating strong value propositions, so my first question is in regards to speed, because mm. we live in a in a in a in a world where content where content is uh, is is very important. Uh, the role of content, everything is digital. Um, but yes, you need to, 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 to be careful about how you create this value proposition. But, you know, we need also speed, right? Mm -hmm. And you work here with very large customers. So the, uh, the importance of speed and, 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 you know, getting things to break a little bit as well and testing, what, how do you see that? I think, I think yeah, speed is a key word here. And I think a, a way to do speed is to, uh, as I said, if you are continuously occupied by what's happening on your customer side, that's at least one step. So is, is changes in your customers something that you discuss quarterly or whatever comes in? Or as I said, is it something that is on them every time you have a meeting, you're discussing customer insights? If that's on the agenda, you are at least on the forefront with what is happening on your customer side. And then secondly, the principle of prototyping. Try something out, testing it with your customers. That makes it speed. So, you know, that design thinking of instead of trying to do something that is 100% great and test it, what are the possibilities you have in order to prototype something, test something with your customers in different uh, ways? And my perspective is that most customers are actually willing to be part of that testing and prototyping and love to be involved in, in that one. So having customer insights on the agenda and prototyping at least two good things that uh, make it uh, work. How challenging is it to create a value proposition for a large enterprise? I don't think it's more challenging to create, a, you know, the size of the companies, I don't think is an issue uh, here. I think the challenging part is to create value propositions when you have products that are hugely commoditized. 
So if you have products that are where the product in itself is not at all differentiating, because then you need to find other ways to differentiate. And the channel discussion can be one way to differentiate how you go into uh, in, in online or e-commerce. And it can be how you add your services into that. It's not difficult, but it makes it a little bit more complicated. If, you, if and, But I think that is how it is. Most companies are in a situation where the core product in itself is, uh, is heavily uh, commoditized. So I think, uh, in my opinion, it's about bringing different people in. You know, so we have sales, marketing, product specialists, bringing them in uh, and then coming up with the uh, with potential differentiators, hundreds of differentiators, and then testing it to the funnel I showed you with the value and the and, and the differentiation element. Can I ask you another question? Yeah, of course. All right. I prefer to look at you. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> uh, the other question I have is more about, so we spoke with Fulfillment Group, and then there I spoke about ancillary services. Mm. So you have a traditional logistics industry that is being, it's like almost having a marketplace, mm -hmm. right, around them and the, the role of ecosystems today. Mm -hmm. How do you see that, especially with the, the size of the customers that you're working here today? Can you? Yeah. I don't know if I'm answering that, but I think touching upon what I just said about when your core product is being commoditized, then for sure the whole supply chain can be an area of, uh, of, of how to differentiate. Um, and I'm very much into the point about, if you remember the two by two, about the perception. So I think there's a lot about creating a perception in the market around what is your strength and take the position, you know, take the position on the dance floor. It might not be that you're super unique, but just take that position and communicate it heavily. And if that's a, a supply chain platform that you are going into or uh, whatever kind of network you're going into, Dare to choose a few differentiators, a few value propositions, and then communicate them heavily to the customer. Because maybe in the eyes of your customers, you will be perceived as being both unique and value creating, even though you might not be super unique. So perception is reality uh, here. So dare to go out and communicate something. Just promise me that you are at least being really, really firm on the value for the customer. That's at least the one approach. Brilliant. So, uh, so that, that was Anas Heffel uh, with Implement Consulting Group. Anas, thank you so much. You're welcome. Great to have you. Uh, moving up next at 11.35, we have Soledad Gonzalez. And Soledad, she's working with a PostNord Sweden. Uh, one of the PostNord is, is uh, one of the largest companies uh, in the Nordics working with logistics and, 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 and yeah, logistics in general. They're heavily uh, invested in e-commerce, uh, e-commerce parcels. And Soledad today will be delivering the trends uh, that are happening in the e-commerce market. Uh, she's going to be specifically talking about the Swedish market, which I find it uh, quite interesting. Uh, the Swedish market, if I'm not mistaken, I'm mistaken, it, it, it is the biggest market in the Nordic. So I think she's going to be uh, um, showing and sharing some, some really interesting trends that um, Post North uh, is seeing firsthand, especially with the customers that they they, they serve today. So, uh, uh, eleven thirty-five. We just have a, a coffee break now, and uh, I'll see you very soon, Soledad.
Uh, Leo, can you bring the Soledad's video, <laughs> please? Hey, Soledad, how are you? Hello, hello, Carlos. How are you doing? Great, thank you. Can you can you try to uh, raise your volume a little bit, or are you using your phone? Absolutely. Oh, good. Now I can have it. That's better. Perfect. So, where are you speaking from today, Soledad? Well, I am in our um, office in Solna, in Stockholm. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. And can you just give uh, give us uh, some highlights of what you're going to be sharing with us today? Absolutely. So uh, I work for Postnote Sweden, as you said, and in my role as e-commerce advisor, I work with following uh, everything that is going on in e-commerce in Sweden in general, and actually uh, in the Nordics as well. And um, so we have a report we work with and that we present every quarter. And that is what I'm going to be presenting, our findings and insights from our report mostly. And then uh, some trends that I see when, when I when I follow what's going on in the market. Fantastic. I'm really looking forward to it. So let's get started. Welcome. Thank you, Soledad. Yes. Yeah. I just need to make sure that I can share my screen and that you guys, guys see my presentation. In a bit. Um, yeah, it's coming. Can you see there? Yep. Yeah. Uh, Great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll leave you now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So today my presentation is, as I said, I will be speaking about e-commerce trends in Sweden and uh, all of the the graphs and the findings and numbers we, we I will be presented are based on our report, Ebarometer, the Ebarometer. So basically, this report it wants to measure, take the temperature uh, for e-commerce in Sweden. And we have done this since 2005. So this is report number 18. Uh, the 18th year we, we, we are doing this and we do, do it quarterly. So the agenda for today, what I will be presenting, it will be divided into three parts. First, I start uh, with an introduction in, to the Swedish e-commerce landscape on what it has looked like um, during and after Corona, which has been, uh, of course, a huge catalyst for e-commerce in general, in Sweden and in the world. Uh, then I'm going to jump into some consumer preferences, particularly when it comes to deliveries. But we, we follow preferences in many different areas uh, when it comes to marketing as well and different areas. But today we'll focus mostly on our findings when it comes to deliveries. And thirdly, I will present some mega trends that I see in the Swedish e-commerce. So starting with the with the, the Swedish e-commerce landscape on how it has changed the last uh, couple of years. So this is historically what revenue has looked like since 2005. As you can see, we, we see, we see that since 2018, it has almost doubled. Um, so uh, as I said, um, the pandemic has obviously had, has had enormous impact on how um, sales online have gone since then. This is what the growth has looked like. Um, if you look back in the days, so historically, since in this chart we show since 2016, the growth yearly has been uh, quite steady between 10 and 15%. But when Corona came then to or 20, year 2020, we saw a huge, remarkable growth, um, uh, reaching up to plus 56 percent on the fourth quarter 2020. Uh, 2020. We ended up having a plus 40 percent uh, growth for the whole of e-commerce during 2020 and 20 percent during 2021. Uh, now, when it comes to year 2022, everybody was like thinking, OK, now is Corona over? What is going to happen? What is the new normal after Corona? And what we've seen is that a clear uh, decline um, in comparison to previous year. But it's, what we need to bear in mind here is that we always now we are comparing to the year before, that is 2021, which was obviously, as I said, a normally um, historically large uh, growth. So obviously minus 8% as we ended up both in the first and second quarter, it's not that remarkable, I would say, um, since uh, it has been historically very, very big. 
so this is what the curve looks like as 2020, 2021 at year 2022. This is always, obviously, as I said, growth, always in comparison to the previous year. So we see, as I said, uh, since uh, the last quarter of 2021, a clear decline on the sales online. But what does it look like in this development? What does it look like in, in different categories? Because obviously different category, product categories, um, are um, affected in different different ways. Uh, so this is what we see. This is what the result for the year 2021, for instance. Um, and we we show the list to the um, on the left or, or the list of, of categories. Uh, the category that grew uh, most was groceries online, uh, plus 35 percent during 2021. And on the second and third place, furniture and home electronics. That was not very, very um, weird because people spend a lot of time at home and they uh, had to fix at home, but also many uh, started working from home. So they made the, made a comfortable you know, office at home as well. So home, both furniture and home electronics uh, were doing very well uh, during the pandemic. Uh, pharmacy products as well. A lot of people and also elderly people start buying their medicine online. So to, of course, avoid being um, in close to other people uh, during Corona. Uh, if this graph is quite interesting, it has a lot of uh, interesting um, numbers. And if you look at the bottom, then we see what the market share in e-commerce looks like in each sector. Then it's very clear that home electronics is a very uh, mature uh, category uh, online. So over 50% of all sales uh, in that in that uh, segment uh, is done online, uh, whereas the category that is uh, the, the the smallest category is groceries, uh, being just six percent of all sales happening online. Swedish people are very used to going to uh, do their groceries um, in physical stores, so it, it was a huge change during the pandemic that actually. Uh, people were uh, obliged uh, or, yeah, they had to um, order their, their food at home. But we see a very clear um, shift again back to physical stores. So what does the development in each category has looked like? What does it look like now, 20, now 2022? As I said, we've seen a decline now, both the first and second quarter. And for the whole of e-commerce, we ended up having minus 8% uh, growth. That's negative growth, of course. And But this has also been different in different categories. As you see, the on the top of the list is pharmacy. They're still going on well. They're doing well still. Plus 30, 13% during the first quarter and plus 4% during the second. Uh, so, of course, the pharmacy products... Um, it's kind of a very easy product to buy online because you know exactly what you need when it comes to medicine or, you know, um, hygiene products. And you don't, maybe you don't need to touch and, and smell and things like that. And also, uh, I'd say that most of these actors in Sweden, the pharmacy actor, pharmaceutical companies, they have been very, very good at logistics and at planning and doing, um, making a, a smooth uh, experience for the customer. So they are both good. The e-commerce e companies are good, but also customers have been um, got more used to buying their medicine online. Groceries, on the other hand, are not doing that well right now uh, online. As I said, Swedish people are very used to doing their groceries in physical stores. So it, this is very clear now when we see almost 20%, um, minus 20% uh, decline in, to, in the first quarter and minus 28% in the second quarter. So uh, people are going back to, to stores, basically. That is what we see. This, so as I said, this is uh, the numbers I'm showing here. Uh, um, sales from, and we get these from uh, large companies in Sweden. But we also ask consumers, what do you buy online? What have you bought online in the last 30 days? And we follow this every month. And what we see is that in 2022, in comparison to 2021, the largest categories are still uh, uh, clothing and footwear and beauty and health. So th those are the most common categories consumers buy from. Um, 
Yeah, and as I said, we see kind of uh, declining the interest for groceries online. Another interesting graph we have is we ask Swedish consumers, what countries do you buy things from when you buy things from abroad? And we see historically how this has changed uh, since 2019. And Germany is clearly the top foreign market for Swedish uh, e-commerce consumers. Um, but uh, yeah, but uh, there are some other countries that are kind of winning customers. That's Denmark. Denmark is becoming more popular as a, as a, as a foreign market for, for Swedish consumers. Whereas China is losing, you know, uh, consumers because, of course, there's been lots of problems during Corona with deliveries from China, but also uh, production, etc. And the UK has also very clearly declined uh, because of Brexit and all the extra costs uh, it requires, you know, buying things now nowadays from the UK. But in general, if you look at the bottom of the chart, uh, we see a decline in, in the interest of Swedish um, consumers um, buying things online from abroad. It's been declining in the last years. And this may be explained, or there's, there may be several reasons. For the, firstly, there's many big actors like Amazon and Salando that have... Uh, um, they have own sites, Swedish sites. So people are buying... Uh, in Swedish sites from these companies. So they are part now of the of home market, we can say. So these may have affected the fact that people don't uh, order as many things. And obviously the problems with uh, long uh, wait, waiting too long to get things from abroad as well. So let's go uh, now into the delivery experience on how do Swedish consumers want to get their, their goods delivered? As, we, as I was saying, uh, Corona has changed the e-commerce landscape quite a lot and also consumer expectations. So we have new consum consumption patterns where the elderly, for instance, have uh, started buying online. Uh, the Swedish population is kind of very um, digital, I would say. Uh, almost everyone, like almost 100%, 95% of the people have access to internet and and um most of the people also know how even the elderly how to use the internet and things like that so it's a very digital population um so what we see also as i said is that the elderly have more and more been um buying th both food and other items online uh oh the the, the graph in the middle i i got it from our report and it was in swedish and um, this is in, on average uh, how long time people have to wait to get a, their their package? Um, so in on average, it's between uh, two and three point two and two point three days uh, in the whole of Sweden. Of course, this is different depending on whether you live in the countryside or in a big city. But in general, consumers expect quicker deliveries and more flexible. I'm going to show that in the coming chart. So in this chart, we ask consumers. What, how did you get your last package? How did you get your last online delivery? We see very clearly that Pudos or distribution points is uh, still the most popular. I mean, people get their, almost 50% of the people, 48% of consumers get their package to Pudos. That is the most common way of getting uh, your delivery. If for you people that don't live in Sweden, Pudos or distribution point is... Um, a place, a service point where you go to, um, obviously, uh, generally to a um, grocery store to get your package. So you get a message and then you go to a grocery store and get your package there. So, uh, see, yes, that's still the most common way of getting packages in Sweden, but home delivery and um, parcel lockers are growing in interest. So the... the um, the more uh, light blue bar shows how the people get their delivery and the dark one shows how they would expect it or would like to get their delivery. So we see a difference there. You see 48% uh, of the people get their package to Pudo, but just 28% said that they wanted it to get the package there. Whereas home deliver, as I said, and parcel lockers grow in interest. Sorry. Then... 
Uh, we also ask people whether they are willing to pay more or to pay for a same day delivery because we want to understand how much uh, they kind of how important it is for them to uh, to get a, um, their products fast. What we see is that uh, in general, on average, 28% of respondents are more willing to pay for fast delivery, are willing to pay. Um, but this is also looks different in different old age groups. So uh, people, the younger people, 18 uh, to 29 and 30 to 49 are more willing to pay uh, for a same day delivery. This is maybe not that weird because these people are generally more uh, busier and they have children, they have career, etc. So uh, yeah, there's a willing their uh, willingness to pay for uh, faster deliveries. And this go a little a bit hand in hand with uh, a huge trend that we see in Sweden that it's the ex explosion because it this market has really exploded. Uh, quick, the, what we call quick commerce, right? It's uh, companies that deliver food and nowadays also other items uh, very quick between 15 and 20, 30 minutes. And there's a lot of actors uh, that do this in Sweden right now. And um, so they are called ultra fast deliveries. Uh, this, uh, I would say, uh, affects the consumer expectations on what we mean with rapidness, with quickness. Uh, so at the end of the day, it also affects us as logistic actors because uh, people expect, of course, that they will get their package much faster. Another important findings from our report are when it comes to marketing, uh, we ask uh, companies what uh, corporation, different companies and corporations that have um, online sales, what is the most common way you you uh, go to market, you communicate with, with your target group. And most of them say that it's via their website, their own website, 62%. Uh, the second largest way of um, working with marketing is with newsletter and email. 35% say that they do it. And Google Ads on the third place. Uh, we see that uh, social media is also growing, but still uh, quite uh, little in comparison. We also ask uh, consumers, uh, uh, what channels do you use when you want to uh, try a new product? And then we see that Instagram and Facebook social media is very, very uh, big among consumers when they want to try or discover a new product or service. And we see also difference uh, between men and women. If you look at the chart below, 58% of young women use Instagram to explore and discover new products. And whereas men is just 21%. We see a difference there between um, different genders uh, that women are often more um use more Instagram, for instance, whereas guys use more YouTube as a channel to discover things. We, we don't have that number there, but it's just the opposite, <laughs> exactly opposite, actually. Right. Some other things that I would like to share is mega trends that I see in e-commerce. So this is not part of uh, our report, but it's uh, part of I, I usually follow market trends and I just want to share what I see is going on in Sweden. One thing that I, in general, is not just in Sweden, but in general, is companies like Shein. Uh, when, if you are not acquainted with this company, they work with what is called real-time fashion. They have a website that is absolutely uh, AI-based. The way they, they work is AI-based. AI so they are very big in social media, particularly TikTok, and their target group is young girls. Uh, so they, they buy, they sell very cheap, like um, dresses and, you know, fashion. So what they do that is really, really smart is like they scrape all over the internet to see what products are trending on social media, for instance. And then they produce this and they put it up on their website to see how much attention this product gets. When they see that there's attention for that product, then they uh, produce this uh, in extremely, extremely fast. Uh, in less than three days, they go from idea to product. So it's extremely AI-based, as I say, production, uh, which I think 
it's kind of exciting, but also uh, it's also a good thing for many companies to think about uh, to to use uh, the data you have uh, in order to to meet your customer needs. Another trend we see is a lot of D 2 C brands. So um, brands that start their business online direct to consumer. Uh, an example of this is a, a, an outdoor brand called Revolution Race. They are very, very well known in Sweden. And uh, what they do is basically they um, open a an e-commerce shop and they they work a lot on social media and with influencers to create a community around the product. In this case, outdoors, outdoors people that are interested in outdoors. And the advantage they have, I would say, is that Firstly, they have much larger mar uh, profit margins than people, uh, distributors that just sell a product. Uh, and they also have control of the data, of course, because they are uh, have a relationship, a direct relationship to the customer. So in that sense, they can get, by building a community, they can understand what the customer's needs are and they can use this information to, to de develop new products. Um, so very interesting what, it, what, they, what they have done differently in comparison to other outdoor uh, brands is that they have they they have they produce colorful cl clothes. Uh, back in the days, uh, outdoor clothes were generally very like gray or dark green, you know, and these clothes are red, pink, uh, orange. So so that's their niche. Another important thing is influencers that are uh, growing a lot in, in Sweden. Um, and that's, I think it's an interesting phenomena in the sense that this girl, for instance, Bianca Ingrosso, she's really huge among young girls. And if she is part of a company called Kaya Cosmetics, so basically they sell beauty. And what is interesting is that she is, um, she, she, she started this brand and she already has all the, the these interested people that follow her. Like she has 1.5 million followers on Instagram. So whatever product she launches, it becomes really big very fast because uh, she she doesn't need to promote that much. I mean, she already has a huge number of followers. So I think it's an interesting phenomenon to follow how uh, influencers build online e-commerce companies. Another trend is marketplaces that are growing and becoming more niched. Uh, so, um, and we have, of course, Amazon and Zalando and those, kind, and those kind of marketplaces, but these marketplaces are specifically for a certain niche. For instance, Stadium Connect is a marketplace that is just for sport people, for sport clothes. Another trend is live shopping and social commerce that is becoming huge in, in Sweden and uh, gamification as part of the customer experience. This we saw um, already became huge in China for a couple of years ago, but now it's also becoming big in Sweden. And another important trend I would say is sustainability. Um, this is, question is very discussed in uh, among other all the Swedish companies and um, it's becoming a hygiene factor. So the customer expects that companies work with with sustainability and these people, I, I chose these pictures because uh, this uh, the, on the to the left, it's an agreement that companies are working on, an industry agreement on what do we mean with fossil free in the checkout. And another initiative in this area is Nordic Swan that wants to, they want to develop uh, some kind of standard for the checkout. What do people write on the checkout when it comes to, in the checkout when it comes to sustainability. I see that I'm running out of time, but one another finding we have when it comes to uh, sustainability in the report, we have a lot of interesting findings when it comes to sustainability. But we ask consumers, what do you when it when it comes to you are doing a, a, a purchase online? How important is uh, uh, sustainability for you? And we say, in general, people say that uh, it's very important. 60% said that they want to have information from companies and things like that. But when it comes to the checkout, um, around 60% of the people say that they will never, um, they would not uh, stop buying something because of sustainability. 
So they say it's important, but when it comes to making a decision, it's over 60% that actually uh, do not take um, sustainability as um, in consideration when they make it, uh, a shop, um, when they make a purchase. So some takeaways, convenience and freedom of choice when it comes to delivery is very important for the customer. Uh, we see after Corona new, new buying patterns and people expect uh, much higher demands when it comes to the delivery experience. They want to have a comfortable and seamless experience. We see also that um, a rapid growth in e-commerce and new players such as marketplaces. And uh, lastly, sustainability that is becoming more important for consumers. Um, and we see that they have also heavier expectations on companies, but when it comes to making a decision online, uh, then sustainability is not that important. So that was all for me. Thank you for your attention. And I'm open if you have any other questions. All right. Soledad, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I actually have one question. Maybe uh, if we can summarize one of the, what would you say it's the biggest challenge today for your customers at uh, PostNord? I think it would be interesting. You shared at the Mastermind session uh, some of the challenges that are you know, you, you would see. So maybe if you were to summarize now in, in, in a minute or so, what do you see? Yeah, as a, as absolutely. A uh, one of the biggest uh, right now when it comes to deliveries and logistics is obviously the supply chain problems we've seen during Corona and that's still going on. Uh, for many companies, they have to think uh, even more when it comes to production, whether they are going to be dependent on the Asian market or they uh, will be also producing things much closer to Europe. That is one thing. And another important thing is, as I said, that consumer expectations are much higher. Uh, so companies need to work a lot on their omni-channel strategy to see which channels they are going to be on uh, since there are so many nowadays. I mean, social media, there's physical stores, there's a store online, your own store, but also being part of a marketplace. So I think it's much more complex nowadays for companies to think what are what is the right channel for me and my company. Fantastic. So Soledad, uh, I'd like to thank you for this. It's amazing to, you know, to, to, to have your presence here today and to count on your insights. And uh, yeah, let's see when we have uh, the, the next one. All right. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. Have a great day. All right. So up next, we have Mateus Ostafil with Devante. And Devante is one of the largest software houses from Poland. They're going to be talking about uh, the, the Mirka case, which is a surface, a leading uh, a company from, uh, from Finland, and they are, uh, you know, the leaders there in surface technology. So Mateus will be talking about how they deployed a, a solution in less than six months. And today, Mirka, you know, they're exporting to several countries. So Mateus, you can join me now. And uh, yeah, really excited to, to be talking to you. Uh, so perhaps you can tell us where you where are you speaking from? Some nice guitars at the background, uh, and tell us a little bit about your your uh, some of the highlights of your 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 speech today, please. Okay, thanks for inviting me. And uh, so I'm I'm based in Poland in a small city called Tarno. Uh, so I'm working remotely. Uh, uh, also before 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 the pandemic and today i'll be focusing on the on the digital transformation and also on the on the pandemic and the challenges because the project uh, our project uh, the implementation of the storefront for mirka happened dur during the pandemic start actually i'll give you a more precise timeline during the presentation because this is quite interesting how right. the how the project uh, actually was uh, like how the pandemic was embedded in the project all right so Mateus, you have the stage now thank you very much i'm looking forward to your uh to your presentation thanks well, let me just uh, share my present my presentation Okay, here it is. Uh, so uh, we've already talked about the, 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 the topic of the presentation. And for some of you, uh, I would like to introduce Mirka. Uh, what is Mirka? Because for me, when I started uh, to work with them like two and a half years uh, before uh, ago, uh, I did not know. Uh, at all what what Mirka is it might be uh, very known in the in the Nordics and in the 
uh, in the surface finishing uh, uh, industry, but it wasn't for, for me at that time. And now after this uh, two plus years of cooperations, uh, co cooperation, it is like Apple in the surface finishing technology because they deliver uh, in... I was able to to actually touch their 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 their, their products and be in their in their headquarters in their factory, and uh, I was really impressed uh, about the detail that they pay uh, for the experience of the of the of the professional users uh, of the of the end users. So they are making these power tools uh, very nice looking and very nice uh, very, very usable. But also they, they are manufacturing abrasives, uh, dust resanders, surface finishing, and everything uh, that, uh, that can be used uh, in surface finishing. And who am I? Uh, so I'm Mateusz Ostafil, and I'm SAP Spartacus Technology Evangelist uh, at Bivanta. So what I do mainly, I promote uh, headless technology, I promote, uh, I, I teach Spartacus, I do some marketing materials, but also technical materials about Spartacus. But in the Mirka project, uh, I was acting as an expert uh, of, of headless technology, but also as a front-end team leader. So I know the project uh, inside out. So I've mentioned Spartacus, so that's something that you might know even less than, than Mirka. So let me just uh, give you a uh, quick uh, sum up what is Spartax. And Spartax is, is a set of Angular libraries that allow uh, building rapid PWA storefront or headless storefront for SAP commerce. And uh, the set of library is developed by Devante with, uh, with uh, it's developed by, uh, by SAP with support of Devante. So we are building this, this solution, uh, solution together. And throughout this talk, you will actually find out how Spartacus helped us uh, delivering uh, delivering uh, the 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 uh, B2B commerce solution in uh, only 6 months. So what I'll be talking about this is the agenda of uh, of my presentation and we have actually gone through that the the two points already so now i'm presenting the agenda and uh, now uh, after that i want to show you the what was the project sc scope uh, and then I would like to focus the most uh, of my presentation on the challenges and how did we overcome them. Uh, and also I'll dive deep a little bit into the text, text stack and then show you the outcomes of the, of the project. Uh, so let's get started. So uh, it was quite a big project because uh, uh, it was like a greenfield project of building uh, a multi sales uh, the main sales channel for uh, for for Mirka. so moving from uh, traditional sales to the to the um, e-commerce so we were uh, supposed to build multi multi market b2b e-store but it also encapsulated the product design so Devante was uh, responsible for, for for designing this uh, this uh, this system of course Mirka had a lot of ideas but uh, the the product design was was, uh, was on our side um, so uh, and it was something beyond the just just b2b e-store uh, it was meant to be a partner portal so it's not like a web shop or uh, or or, or e-store it's called partner portal that's because it's a tool for the partners so the partners can check their status there uh, they can uh, have a look at the knowledge base uh, because um, mirka before struggled with like keeping uh, uh, in sync with their partners, with the current uh, sales materials, current instructions and, uh, and things like that. So all the materials uh, are available through, throughout the, the partner, uh, throughout the portal. Uh, also the partner portal supported uh, reporting features for their partners. So the partners can check their, uh, their, um, their performance, their sales performance and the buying performance. Uh, they can also manage their own organizations. So if the partners have multiple employees, they can set up uh, who is responsible for what for uh, for for buying for approving the 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 purchases and many many more features were uh, developed uh, developed throughout this project uh, so the scope was quite high. That was one of the first challenges, but not all of these. Uh, we had a lot more challenges. The first one we've mentioned uh, during the introduction. So the project start actually was 
almost the same time when the when the pan- pandemic started. Uh, so when uh, we were when Mirka was um, announcing the uh, request for uh, proposals, uh, and there were the the final presentation was um, set up somewhere in the uh, in in the March. 2020. I don't remember the, the exact date, but I remember that we were supposed to go to Mirka headquarters and present our uh, our offer there. But uh, the the flight was canceled two days before because the, the, the pandemic started and the lockdown started that time. Um, and that was uh, the one, one of the main challenges. The other one was that uh, we uh, had an intercompany remote uh, remote team. So remote during uh, because of the pandemic was something new but it was for for everyone but we had an intercompany team because we were working with uh, also with kps who were the the backend provider divant was responsible for the product design and the front end uh so we not only had to learn to work with ourselves remotely but also with with other uh companies so there were three entities that had to work together and to be honest, that was the, our first Spartacus project. Of course, we had the experience of building the Spartacus as a, as a library, but the, it was our first implementation project. And it was one of the first on the market because we were starting with Spartacus version 2, which was very uh, very early on the, uh, on the market. And uh, it was kind of... Uh, kind of uh, adventurous <laughs> choice to, 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 to build with Sparta, I guess. But it, in the end, uh, you'll see that it was the right choice. And uh, at that time, this version 2.0 of, of Sparagus had, had missing B2B features. It was on the roadmap, so it was planned, but it was missing and some things we had to uh, code ourselves. Uh, and the deadline actually was the, the, the most challenging because it was like uh, half a year, six months. Uh, so for, for delivering, delivering such a huge project, it was, it was quite short. And what all, what uh, what did not help is was that uh, in the project planning we missed one thing that uh, there is a something like Finnish holiday, uh, which is not popular in, uh, in 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 Poland and in the UK because KPS our other partner was uh, from uh, UK uh, that the Finnish people go on holiday all at the same time, so it uh, impacted a little bit uh, the, the the pace of the project. Okay, so how did we overcome the the, the, the challenges like the like the pandemic? Uh, the first thing was that uh, Devante even before pandemic uh, was betting on rem- remote, uh, so the working remotely was was allowed uh, since uh, I don't know when, but long before 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 the pandemic started. So the people were already used to uh, used to working remotely. Uh, we all also are kind of uh, quite flexible company because we are working with, with different technologies, with different uh, different markets, different uh, companies. So it it also help uh, the communication. I know it's 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 like a slogan here, but we really had a great project manager who made. Uh, everyone to talk to each other even remotely and uh, and forced us a little bit to 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 work together uh would help and and that helped and actually i would say here that uh, in some in some way pandemic uh helped us in communication and in working together uh because it was not like some like like one company is 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 um is working remotely and uh the rest of the team is 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 work on site because such a mix uh, is not working uh, well because no because not everyone are on the same level uh, in in discussion if some part of the uh, of the team is uh, meeting face to face and some part is just calling in then it's uh, then it's it's uh, it's it's not fair I would say uh, but here uh, because of the pandemic we were all in the same situations and the kids that were running in the background uh, and, and 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 all the other uh, issues and we could we could see each other homes that brought us actually closer than we, we would be working um, than we would be working uh, in in the office because in the office we were very official and here uh, when the the whole families were were like involved in that in, in that uh, in that project. So that's the thing that uh, pandemic actually, I think, uh, helped the project uh, uh, this way. Uh, 
So the cooperation, this is uh, something, this is a photo that uh, was taken uh, from our visit uh, at the at the Mirka uh, office. And uh, after this long working time, uh, we were able to form one team, even though we are from all different companies. But this comes with a time. So we, we had to be patient that, you know, it's not like we can be one team since the day one. Uh, we need to estimate that, some things will take time and at the beginning our pace and our velocity will be smaller than uh, we will have in the end and the important thing is that uh, not to forget that uh, to have fun during the, the project to have fun uh, of, of, of what we are doing doing what we, what we are building but also to have uh, fun uh, besides the besides the project and what helped us hitting the deadline and it was for sure, for sure, Spartacus, because Spartacus, as mentioned before, uh, allows for rapid uh, front-end development, uh, and uh, it was like a test ride. <laughs> this project was uh, was like a test ride for the project, and we, well, the the the, the assumption was that it it does, but uh, throughout this project, we prove uh, we have proven that uh, because it uh, gives you a lot of features out of the box. Uh, and it gives you a unified architecture, so you don't have to spend time on thinking how to build, how, how to structure things. You just, you just uh, customize the features to your needs. Uh, but besides Spartacus, we also, what we did, we planned all the sprints uh, up front because six months is not that much and we had like three week, three week long sprints so uh, we could count <laughs> count uh, the sprints on our hands. Uh, so we, we, we could plan all, uh, all, uh, all that sprints uh, ahead so we could see if that is doable at all. Uh, then we applied a realistic margin, margin. So, for example, we assumed that developers don't work eight hours a day; they work six hour uh, six hours a day effective, effectively. And we also assumed that uh, when there is a sprint start and the sprint end, they they like uh, get uh, two days uh, no no like non working days because there are lots of meetings and and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's something that we took into into account. And we also had to expect the unexpected. So even though all the sprints were planned ahead, different things uh, could happen. There was COVID, so people got sick from time to time. So we had to replan the things and also uh, at, some at some point employ more, uh, more uh, developers. Uh, and because the sprints were planned ahead, we, could knew, we, we knew that upfront and we could uh, arrange some more resources uh, earlier. So let's talk now about the tech stack. And uh, the main point in our tech stack was uh, actually Spartacus. And here we can see that this is the uh, integration uh, integration point uh, because we integrated with a lot of surface, uh, services. Uh, and Spartacus perfectly allows for that because Spartacus is, is built in headless, uh, headless commerce in, uh, in mind. So Spartacus itself is built on uh, on, on Angular, uh, and what we added to this is, were the integrations with, for example, uh, CMS uh, Optimizely. Previously, it was known as EpiServer. Uh, we also integrated with uh, it with ImageKit, which is uh, the image optimization service. Uh, we integrated it with SAP uh, Gigia, or now called CDC, Customer Data Services for uh, uh, single sign-on, um, and also for payments, we used Adyen. Out of the box, Spartacus has an integration with SAP Commerce, and it's prim primarily built for integrating integrating with 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 SAP Commerce. However, because of um, Mirka internal systems, the commerce backend was affected in some way. So some 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 data structures changed, uh, and some uh, some. Um, some some uh, flows has, have also changed, so we had to adapt to uh, to that situation. So now let's uh, head on to 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 the to the end of this uh, of this uh, presentation. So let me share with you the outcomes of the project. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have uh, any financial data 
<laughs> so uh, I, uh, I, I, I cannot, uh, even, uh, even though if I had, I couldn't uh, share that with you. However, I can tell you that it was quite significant boost in, in revenue for Mirka because uh, the the because of the partner portal they have received the their partners have received like a surf service portal so they could make purchases purchases on their uh, on their own uh but uh, what was also a great outcome was that we delivered the project in six months so so we hit the deadline and that was thanks to Spartacus and a couple of other things uh, and now Mirka is uh, serving this uh, this portal to 16 countries among two continents so here you can see uh, the uh, the countries that are served uh, currently and there are more coming because we've extended the cooperation uh, and now we have two plus years two and a half year almost uh, of of, uh, of cooperation and we are still uh, continuing the cooperation and uh, building new features and uh, and uh, releasing this to new countries and my own <laughs> my my, uh, my own uh, uh, memory from the project is that I was able to visit uh, Finland and have uh, an opportunity to visit uh, Finnish sauna and uh, remember this this smell uh, <laughs> of of coal. Uh, but the most significant thing that I would like to end with is the quote from the Mirka partner who were. Uh, using the the, the the partner portal and he said that this is the best thing Mirka has ever done <laughs> so uh, I think during this project we could uh, keep up the the idea of Mirka of like delivering great user experience to to the professional users who are using their tools to move that experience to the uh, the, the the partner portal. So thank you very much for listening. If you would like to know more about uh, about this project, here is a link to the case study that we have um, wrote down. Uh, it's on our, available on our website. There are some more uh, more more detailed information. Thank you again. Very nice, Mateus. Uh, Mateus, just so yes, <laughs> <laughs> I'm on point. So uh, first off, thanks for this. Really nice, interesting presentation. I, I have, uh, I think, one or two questions. The first one, we, we had this mastermind, our, our networking session mm -hmm. in, in the morning, and we spoke about acronyms. So a lot of people, they, you know, they listen to Gartner, but they don't even know what they're eating. You know what I mean? So they don't even understand what Headless is, you know, what mm -hmm. sort of platform they should have. So they just buy into this without understanding. And I would like, I would love if you could just say uh, your views on this, you know, like not necessarily express, explain what is headless, but the need that we have eventually uh, for education today in digital mm -hmm. commerce, uh, because there's a lot of, you know, talking. Misunderstandings. And, misunderstandings, yeah, correct. Yeah, so... Uh... A lot of clients come come to us uh, with uh, with the idea to move to headless uh, because they have they have heard that this is uh, useful for their <laughs> for, 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 for for their commerce, uh, but you know nothing comes without a price. Uh, so even though headless brings some benefits, it also brings some con consequences that you have to uh, think about. So you need to have new competences in in uh, in, in your organization to 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 manage this. Uh, you need to know uh, that the approach, for example, this is a very technical thing, but uh, one of the crucial ones that the approach to performance of your website is different. So you uh, you have to fine tune it differently, and there. Are, a lot of technical details that you have to have uh, at the back of your head. So what you should do first is to educate the client uh, what headless actually is and how this would fit to to to, to his or her uh, her um, her problem. Perfect. Uh, in your views, um, it's all, I mean you went with Spartacus, and I don't want to get very technical because I'm not a techie mm -hmm. guy myself. But how should you evaluate in that case, or usually an e-commerce platform? How you know? How do you how do you go about that? Uh, mm -hmm. 
So in case of Spartacus, the, the, the thing is quite simplified because this is the best uh, idea when you are uh, on SAP. When you are using SAP Commerce, then uh, SAP suggests that as a uh, replacement for the uh, accelerators, which, which, which are supposed to be uh, deprecated uh, pretty soon. Uh, so it's like a very first uh, first step and it has a lot of out of the box features but anyway anyways you should evaluate if there is anything uh, uh, anything uh, better than that but um usually usually if you are already on sap commerce then and you don't want to go away from that then there is ra rarely a better a better sol solution perfect my last question i promise we still have some time we're good uh, in terms of, so, um, Mirka, very interesting case. They export to several countries, which uh, can you perhaps, if you remember, because it's been some time, but um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about the, the benefits now of Mirka selling their products digitally and how they are, you know, how, they, how that impacted the business overall? Um, yeah, so <laughs> unfortunately, I'm not that business guy, so uh, I don't know the, the, the inside and outs, but uh, they could actually pretty fast uh, establish new markets. So I think, I don't want to lie to you, but I've heard that they've, they, they've established uh, in, in when they, uh, the biggest boost they had in, in Spain, where they established the, 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 the storefront, they haven't had a uh, well-established market, market there. And thanks to the partner portal, uh, they increased revenue in that market. Uh, so yeah, the... Yeah. No, very interesting. But I think from a business perspective, we can al we can always rely on on uh, on the Devante team and also to to answer some of the questions if you know people might have. Uh, I think also uh, would be nice if people want to add you on LinkedIn and Devante team because uh, you you know like uh, from a also to learn more about you guys. So yeah, and and my hobby is uh, knowledge sharing. So <laughs> so so I, I invite you also to 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 ask questions, and and I'm I'm open for uh, nice discussions. Brilliant, Mateusz, uh, this was great. So I'd like to thank you very much. Let's see if there are any questions that came through. I'm not sure. Uh, any questions? No. Um, maybe later. So, maybe later. Exactly. So, but anyhow. Great, great to have you, Mateusz, and thanks very much thanks. for this. See you next time, yeah? See you. See you. All right. So up next, and this is our last presenter. We're going to speak. I'm, uh, Niels Olsen will be presenting his, his uh, case. He's going to be talking uh, uh, how can companies secure resilient operations and stay on top of cost, price, in a disruptive world, both from a down and upstream perspective in the value chain, uh, we'll start. We'll start his uh, speech at twelve thirty-five. So we have some time for for some coffee break here, and I'll see uh, Niels very very soon. All right, see you guys soon.
All right, so here we are. Uh, Nils Olsen. How you doing there, Carlos? Good, man. How are you? Quite all right, thank you. All right, where are you speaking from today? I'm in Stockholm, Sweden, I'm broadcasting. I'm happy to be Good. here with all the rest of the speakers. Yeah, nice. I've been there once. Beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, maybe you can just give us some highlights about your, your speech today. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, absolutely. Um, so I'll be talking about how um, manufacturing with complex products can stay on top of uh, both the upstream and downstream value creation uh, from a cost and price point of view in a disruptive world. As we know, there are tons of things happening around us, um, putting a heightened sense of, of requirements in, on companies to, to act in a, in a good and, and conscious way. Brilliant. All right, man. So uh, you're on. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much. All right. All right. So um, just to start off um, for everyone, my name is Nils Olsen. Uh, I'm the Chief Product and Strategy Officer at Tacton. Uh, Tacton, we're an organization uh, providing software as a service for the manufacturing industry um, to help gain a competitive edge in a disruptive world. Um, so I will be, as I just mentioned, touch on how we can affect the business outcome uh, for real, um, how companies can secure resilient operations uh, and stay on top of cost and price. Now, the first thing that I'd like to start with is actually to take a step back and uh, look at the manufacturing industry. We don't often think about it, but the manufacturing industry is it's really the foundation of the modern world. It's um, what basically drives our evolution. Um, over the 
centuries, uh, we have constantly tried to get a uh, better uh, way of life, better quality of life. Um, and, you know, if you think about it, in developing countries today, uh, the most common tool is actually a smartphone. Um, and that's made possible by uh, global supply chains, global manufacturing companies working together uh, across the world. So manufacturing is really a key pillar of our society and, and also of our future. At the same time, uh, we do see, of course, um, and this is a picture which is uh, probably engraved in many people's uh, minds, um, the evergreen uh, blocking uh, the Suez Canal and the huge impact that it had on the supply chain globally. I mean, it didn't just affect ships that were providing goods through the Suez Canal. All of a sudden, it started impacting other routes and other supply chains as well. Um, so what it really highlights is that although we're dependent on the global uh, setup of, of how the world works today uh, in many different ways, it is also a vulnerability. Now, there is a of course, issue with not just the supply chain, but also, you know, the fact that we've come out of um, the worst pandemic in, in a century. And of course, recent events that have been going on in, in Ukraine and the ensuing, um, uh, let's call it issues in, in terms of supply chain that that has caused. So what we're seeing is, is really a ripple effect of many different things contributing to um, what is quite a tough challenge. However, amongst or amidst, I should say, this global unrest, um, there is also a very strong public opinion. Um, and that needs to be taken into consideration as well. Just because we do have issues with supply chains, we have issues with, with um, unrest and, and uh, war in some parts of the world, um, we shouldn't forget about things like the climate crisis that we're currently in. And all of these things kind of contribute into what becomes hugely important for in essence, every organization out there, which is a very clear link between high purpose in terms of how you operate, how you drive your organization, what values you have, and the success that you have in the market. Companies that embrace change attract better employees, perform better in the market. It's just facts. This is you know well studied. However, to have clarity in purpose, you also need to have clarity in operations. So the big question, of course, is how can we build resilience and growth beyond the disruption? How can we thrive in a world that is posing us all of these challenges? Well, I'd like to, to focus a little bit on one aspect of this. Um, we've heard previous speakers talk a lot about uh, for instance, how you can move closer to uh, your end customer, how we can make sure that we have transparency in terms of the uh, buying process. What I would also like to highlight is not all goods are bought directly online. If we look at companies that Taxon works with, and there's quite a few of them, this is just a, a few of, of all the, the organizations that we're working with. We can see that these companies um, they have something in common. They tend to sell not, you know, small items that you uh, can sort of pay with your credit card. Um, they sell big solutions. They sell capital equipment that can be configured in a multitude of ways, actually in more ways than we can imagine, uh, together with uh, services that will enable the equipment to perform in the right way, and all to reach an outcome that is valuable for the customer. So with all of these companies, the one thing we see in common is that they have very high product variants. So one product isn't just one thing that you order you know, from some place and sell um, uh, on in the value chain. It's a ton of different suppliers, very often a ton of redundant suppliers because you need to be able to choose um, the low risk and, and, and low cost routes in the value chain uh, from an, from an um, uh, upstream perspective, but also from a downstream perspective, um, it comes with a ton of different requirements. So every single customer, in essence, that you sell to will have a slightly different outcome in mind. 
So it requires a ton of agility um, to be able to juggle all of those different aspects. So if we look at the type of equipment that you will find in these types of companies, uh, this is just an example. Um, what you're looking at now is probably something that most of us haven't seen um, in our lives. This is a baking machine. So the loaves of bread that you buy down in the supermarket, they of course come from somewhere. And bakeries of today is not like somebody's, you know, making a dough and putting it in the oven. There are entire production lines behind that. Now, when you sell a piece of equipment like this or the full line, the full production line in the bakery, um, you see that the complexity of the products gives you a, um, an amount of, of issues to deal with, which is borderlining infinite. Just to take an example here, if you have a product with 500 configurable parts, that actually gives us a total of 10 power to 150 potential solutions. It's a huge amount of different things that you could be offering to the customer. Now, of course, there's only going to be one solution out of all the solutions that you have available that is going to be the most suitable one for your customer. But there's also going to be one solution that is most suitable for you from a supply chain perspective. So the real problem that we're seeing in complex manufacturing is that we have three, in essence, areas in the organization. We have sales that are trying to satisfy the needs of your customers. There's engineering that are trying to make sure that you have the best products available with the best specifications and possibilities in terms of outcome. And at the same time, staying compliant with um, the different requirements that, that we see in the market. And then, of course, you have the supply chain side of the organization. who are constantly trying to make sure that you take the lowest risk and lowest cost route to be able to fulfill the needs of the customers that, um, that sales are engaging with. This basically means that these diverse customer needs require solutions with a high degree of flexibility. And that in turn makes it hard to both sell and deliver them with good profitability. So if I look at the kind of core things that needs to be uh, under control, it is really about in, in the full supply chain, and this goes for pretty much any company in, in the supply chain, but of course it, it is um, extremely important for companies that are selling uh, highly complex capital equipment, such as the baking machine that I showed you before. The first one is to have the availability and cost under control. Now, with the kind of you know, issues we've seen in supply chain, the evergreen uh, disaster in the Suez Canal that I showed before as well, that puts a lot of um, issues in terms of control in place. So how can you make sure that the items that you're configuring in your product, in the solution that you want to sell to the customer is available? or has a very low risk of not being uh, uh, available at the time you need to deliver it to your customer. And at the same time, you need to stay on top of cost. So if we're looking at you know, individual parts, for instance, let's say you can take an easy example with screws, right? So if you're using screws in your, in your assembly um, setup, you're, you're basically screwing things together. Um, you could quite easily say that, okay, we're gonna have you know, a couple of different types of screws, uh, then we're gonna, probably want to have a couple of different suppliers for those screws. And on that level, it's really easy to keep track of inventory, keep track of you know, what are the prices from the various suppliers and what's the availability in terms of lead time. Now, what that means though, is if you're putting this on a highly configurable machine, all of a sudden, it's not just one item that you need to keep track of. It's the combination of all the items. So you're gonna have one configuration of equipment that's gonna have an overall lower um, potential of issues um, with, with um, the supply chain. At the same time, of course, you need to stay on top of the lead time and quality in your internal processes, making sure that uh, you can build the, the thing that you're um, looking to build and, and that it has the right settings, that has the right um, uh, features and capabilities that your customer is looking for. And then downstream, of course, your customers are ultimately looking for the outcome of what they will get from you uh, what your solution will, will enable them to achieve. But of course, also the price. And the price and the cost tend to have a very strong correlation. So the challenge here is not just 
to be able to configure these complex solutions. The real challenge is to make sure that you're optimizing the solution that you're offering to the customer for the whole good of your organization. That you're, of course, winning the deal with the customer at a price which is, um, you know, sitting with good margin, but also that you avoid risk uh, in being able to fulfill that, um, that uh, order from the customer. So at Tacton, uh, we often talk about something called trusted configuration. And it's not just trusted, it's also connected. So if we look at the three areas again, sales, engineering, and supply chain, traditionally we're sitting with a number of tools in these areas uh, that support us in our daily lives, support us working throughout the, the, the workflows and the processes in the organization. We have CRM in sales, we have PLM and CAD in engineering, and we have ERP, uh, supply relationship management, uh, and so forth, uh, so forth in, in uh, the supply chain side of the organization. The traditional way of, of working with this is that engineering develops something, basically sends it over to supply chain in terms of a product introduction. You now understand how you're going to build this, what suppliers you're going to use, and so forth. And you launch it to the market uh, together with sales and marketing. Um, making sure that that uh, the awareness is is ramped up so you can start supplying the new uh, equipment. And eventually, of course, then taking quotes and understanding the availability uh, or sending out quotes and understanding the availability of those products that you're selling. The issue with this is that, as you can tell, all of these different areas in the organization, they're sitting with their separate tools. They're kind of siloed. In the CRM, we don't talk about engineering bill of materials. We don't talk about um, you know, lead time and, and stock levels in, in the minute details of, of the parts that go into equipment. And in engineering, we very rarely talk about price levels. We very rarely look at the, the stock levels as well, for that matter. And in supply chain, it's all about making sure that you can build equipment, but not so much focus on the actual outcome for the customer, because that's something that you're promising in sales. So what we attacked and do is we introduce the capability of being able to connect these three areas. We use it, uh, do it with a tool called Tacton CPQ. Um, it's in essence a tool that allows us to both configure the equipment from a sales point of view, as well as um, make sure that it's correct from a technical point of view. But the really cool thing is that we can also stay on top of the availability of the parts. So. Tacton CPQ, CPQ, just for those of you who don't know what a CPQ is, it stands for Configure Price Quote. It's in essence what lets you uh, choose the right product from your portfolio uh, and make sure that you have it um, priced in a way that will uh, give you good margins and low risk in, in sales. So what this allows these organizations that we work with to do is to all of a sudden take down the time it takes to understand what solutions you should be providing your customers with from often weeks or even months down to just minutes. And we secure that it's one, correct from an outcome point of view for the customer, two, that it's technically valid, that it can be built and that it does what uh, you're promising to your customer, but three, that you actually have a low risk in terms of your order fulfillment in supply chain. So by having, for instance, lead times, by having stock levels, by having cost updated instantly. You now don't have to have people sending information back and forth. It simply just updates um, the system with the correct data and avoids picking things that are unavailable, uh, avoids picking things that have low margins, um, and of course, focuses on making sure that you great, create great customer value. So the outcome of this is really what we call end-to-end -end agility and predictability. Uh, agility, of course, being able to quickly change what is being sold depending on the situation and as it changes. Predictability, making sure that when you're putting a quote out there, you know exactly what equipment you have offered. You know exactly down to the last detail what you're actually sitting with in terms of, um, in terms of delivery. So it gives us much better possibilities of looking ahead. It gives us much, much better possibilities to act quickly and ultimately, what this leads to are some really great results in the organization. 
So the results we see from transparency in operations are kind of three key things. The first one is on the revenue side. By being able to be more agile in sales, quicker to respond to customer needs with better and more accurate quotes, uh, we see growth in both sales volume and even in deal margin because we're right-sizing the products from the very beginning. Oversizing is a classic issue in the manufacturing industry. So right-sizing the products, being super fast to respond to customer needs, that basically has a really positive impact on, on the sales. Efficiency, of course, there's a decreased cost of sales and supporting functions. We no longer have to have all of the different product experts and um, supply chain managers involved in understanding how and what we can sell. So by automating that, we're freeing up these resources very often to do much more value adding tasks. Uh, product experts, for instance, or engineers uh, typically didn't go through engineering school to, to sit with, with quotes and, and verify different types of statements. They would much rather focus on building uh, and innovating new things. And then the last one is quality. So once you get an automated uh, structure in place of how you create these quotes with the right technically valid um, uh, pieces of equipment in them, you decrease order errors, which leads to less rework internally. But even more importantly, it also leads to less issues with your customers because you're able to fulfill their requirements better and better over time. So we actually see decreases in things like warranty costs, um, penalty fees, um, and claims from customers amongst the companies we work with. So I can see that I've been uh, roughly at it now for 20 minutes. So I'm going to uh, ask um, Carlos to perhaps switch back to uh, our common view. And perhaps you have some questions for me. Perfect. Uh, actually, I have no, uh, there, there, there were no questions from the audience, but maybe I can ask you a few questions. Sure. So, in terms of, uh, so thank you for, for this. I think it's really nice and super interesting because it is, there's a lot of complexities in the world of B2B, right? Sure. Um, so what do you see um, in terms of, because uh, we talked about B2B commerce here. Is this something that you're seeing that the customers are also moving towards? Uh, how do you see that? That's, that's, that's my first question. Yeah, the, the, there are very clear trends in the industry uh, in, a, in a number of different ways. Uh, of course, you know, uh, customer experience, being closer to your customer is as true in B2B manufacturing as it is anywhere else. Naturally, with the type of products that I was uh, talking about here before, you can kind of see that this is not what you kind of go on to Amazon and buy. I mean, one of these um, baking uh, production lines uh, probably has a cost, a total cost of, let's say, 5 million euro. Um, and on top of that, there's a huge projecting um, uh, sort of work that goes into it. It has to fit within a certain factory and so forth. However, if you can make the products available to your customers um, and with the type of tools that we're providing, make it easy for them to understand what they could actually get from you, you're actually cutting a huge amount of time from the sales cycle and also increasing the odds of the customer choosing you. I think there was a, a study uh, some time back, a couple of years back, that said that more than half of the customers have decided what suppliers they will choose before they contact the salesperson of the potential suppliers. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I think like as let's call myself as a marketer, I believe that if the website is good and enables you to converse, you want a salesperson there to actually be a consultant because yes. a lot of the research will be done beforehand, right? And so if you're able to offer a good experience, and I think there was a research from Intershop with, uh, with another company from Sweden talking about one of the trends in terms of B2B commerce is, is exactly what you're offering, uh, CPQ technology, you know, and because you, you can actually help customers configure a lot of, a lot of their, their features and, right? Exactly. You can immerse your customer in your product portfolio at an extremely early stage, even before you have your first interaction with them uh, between people. Yeah, 
One, one of the things also that, that uh, got my attention about your technology is that you're able not only to configure price, but also colors and, and other things, right? Uh, like when you're on the site of the, let's say, Tetra Pak or whatever it is, uh, you can actually play, play a lot with the, the, with the technology, almost like a, a first layer of an e-commerce, right? Absolutely. Like a I mean, exactly. No, so um, we, there's a lot of the companies we work with, they, they actually have... Um, the possibility for, for people to not just go on and configure the products and see, you know, what can I have and so forth, but actually do complete visualization. It's something that we support with, with TACT and CPQ. So you can have a full 3D, even artificial reality model. So you can, for instance, configure a truck and then hold up an iPad and see the truck uh, in your garage or on, on the side um, of the road. Uh, it is just such an amazingly more immersive way of... Uh, getting your customers to understand what you can do for them. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Uh, well, I'd like to thank you, Niels. It was uh, great to have you on board here today. You shared uh, some, some really interesting insights. And to be honest, this is very complex. So I think you were able to, <laughs> to make it easy, easier to understand. You know? So I, 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 I thank you for your time and for, for everything that you, you shared here today. Thank you very much, Carl. It's a pleasure to be thank here. You. All right. Have a great one. Have a good one. All right. Okay, so it's time to call it the day. And I would like to thank you all for uh, being here. This is what Evolve stands for. We are a company that believes in alliances. We are a company that believe in community. Nothing happens without partnerships in a world that is so complex. And I'll have a clue here because we had so many speakers that I need to, uh, to use a clue here today. But first off, we had Henrik Nielsen with DSV talking about how they managed to, 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 to keep their customers in the Nordics, you know, uh, with their supply chain flowing. Very complex. We, we just heard again news talking about the Swiss uh, canal that was, was, was blocked. And so, new, um, so Henrik first shared some uh, how DSV managed to, to help their customers. Rene delivered a super interesting talk, Rene with uh, Oxygen, about communication, about uh, uh, how, to, uh, how, how can digital natives and native immigrants communicate better to implement solid B2B e-commerce solutions. Hans then, uh, with Fulfillment Group, talked about how the consumer has transformed the logistics industry and what's the role of technology today. Ben Jones also, who's a CCO there, uh, gave some, some interesting insights. So thanks for that, Ben. Rafael Berti, founder of Paragon, he shared some re really interesting insights. And uh, before talking to him some time ago, I wasn't even aware that you could, that Amazon also had a B2B uh, solution on, on the Amazon marketplace. So really interesting insight shared by Hafa. Anders ha uh, Anas Heifeld here from Implement Consulting Group shared how do you create uh, powerful value propositions. So I, I, this is a topic that I, I love uh, because it's, I think it's all about listening to your customers. And sometimes we might think that we understand our customers, but we really need to uh, to, 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 to dig deep, have conversations, and really get granular about what is it that our customers really want. Soledad delivered, Soledad Gonzalez with uh, PostNord. She delivered some amazing insights about what's happening in the Swedish markets uh, in terms of e-commerce, e-commerce trends there. So um, thanks for that, Soledad. Mateo, Mateusz. Uh, with Devante, uh, spoke about how Mirka, this giant Finnish company, uh, implemented their, their B2B portal in less than six months and now are exporting to multiple countries. And Niels Olsen with Tacton, I really liked his presentation. I think what they are doing, CPQ technology, is something quite complex. So um, he spoke about how can you actually get out, uh, remove a lot of the complexity in the world of uh, 
uh, for B2B companies, for manufacturers, actually. And, and so uh, thanks for that, Nils. So that's, that, that's it from, from me. Uh, all of these uh, presentations will be available on the Evolve channel. They are all going, they are all recorded there. So you're welcome to follow our channel. You're welcome to follow uh, me, myself, Carlos Monteiro or Evolve on LinkedIn. And that's it for the day. So I'd like to thank you all. I'd like to thank you to, to say thanks to all of our partners and sponsors. And also special thanks to Garmin who decided to join us and support us uh, here on this event. So thank you all. Thanks to Implement Consulting Group here because we are using their facilities today. So thanks. Have a great one. All the best. <laughs>